thanks a lot for coming on here. I appreciate it. I know you're you're still active duty, and um, sometimes guys are apprehensive about doing that just because um, you know they're still doing the job. But um, we've had had some guys on here that are active duty, and uh, I want to say thanks for coming on because I think it's important to hear like current stories too, not just like uh, history stuff. I think it's good to hear about what you've done, but also like what you're doing. So um, again, thanks a lot for coming on. I appreciate it, and um, uh, I see that you're. Uh, up on an early Sunday like I am, so that, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got no issues waking up early. Yeah, yeah, days, I, so. me neither. I, I was fine <laughs> with it. Yeah, I was like, that's a good, idea. actually, a good idea. Um, so uh, yeah, so um, we kind of start off with um, you know your background and where you how you started um, uh, before the military. What kind of prompted you to join the military, and then uh, we kind of go from there. So yeah, feel free to uh, let us know about all that stuff. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, JD. Uh, yeah, initially I was a little um, concerned, uh, like you said, just being active duty, but realized I'm probably not going to go on to any other uh, cool secret assignments. So, uh, yeah, it would be nice to share with some of your listeners uh, my background. So I've been in the military 18 years. I joined in 2004. Um, uh, initially, I went in as a SEER candidate. Um, some of the SEER guys here at work um, – I don't know if they find that funny or not, but yeah. So initially I, um, it sounded appealing. Um, they had advertisements for TACP and CCT, but I was like, wow, they had an opening right away. So I, I joined SEER um, and I didn't make it through the, uh, I made it to the second to last day of assessment. It was the cadre who, who yeah, I think is the, oh yeah, this is my obligatory. Is that supposed to, yeah, that's the, yeah. <laughs> right, right. I, I, uh, it's never you. Exactly. Yeah, I was I was terrific. No, I, I had re- I had a lot of trouble um, sewing. And I had a lot of trouble. Uh, oh, really? Wood- yeah, yeah. Big surprise. So usually that's funny because usually it's like oh, I couldn't do the pull ups or I couldn't run or I couldn't swim, and you're like, no, I just couldn't figure out that sewing part. No, no, yeah. I, I, yeah the guys will tell you here, but it's it's, uh, it's like six six stitches per inch, and it has to be a locking stitch. So. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah, I was. Uh, I just couldn't get it. I, I could teach, and physically, I was. I was good. You know, I was okay. But uh, also, I think like maturity wise, like I wasn't. I wasn't there. So, and I noticed a difference uh, between the guys that they would allow to come back in, like, hey, we'll just recycle you, versus me. They're like, uh, you got to go. Oh, so, really? Yeah, yeah. I was like, <laughs> all right. How so, old were you back then? Did you come in when you were eighteen, or were you older? I was. I was twenty. Yeah. Oh, okay. 20. Yeah. So I had. I guess we should kind of going back like my dad was uh air force and his dad was air force oh, okay so i had i had made the determination not to join the air force or not to join the military early on okay uh yeah it's kind of strange i was like uh, i'm gonna be a college student and just elevate myself above this um and i went to two years of te- technical school and i didn't do well like i was sleeping in my classes and then, uh, you know, people want to hear like it was a patriotic thing or like I wanted to stand up for my country. And it just it turned out to be just something that uh, not a last resort, but like kind like, of. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, mean, I, I kind of was in the same boat. I didn't I didn't want to go to college. You know, I, I didn't you know, there was no jobs out there. Right. When I was trying to come in. So I, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's like, hey, the military, you get you know, it's a good opportunity. They give you three hots and a cot and, you know. It's a, it's a nice fallback for sure. <laughs> yeah. My dad, man. So my mom was like really disappointed. Uh, just, you know, all mothers to see their kids go off into the military, especially, you know, the, the war on terror had been going on for what, three years. So, you know, she's like, you're going to get deployed. So my dad was, was pretty excited about it, obviously. So, you know, fast forward, uh, I didn't make it through Sear. Oh, this is, this is interesting. So the job that I did end up going into, typically when you get kicked out of some of those assessment and selections, the you go straight to a, to be a security forces guy. Um, oh right, right. Yeah, that was like the typical thing. So um, the Sunday after I, I got washed out, uh, I'm not really religious. I grew up religious, but I decided to go to church that day. First time ever. It was weird. The pastor, who was the security forces commander. You know, asked asked every in the, the congregation who's new here. So I, I was the only one to stand up. I said, Hey, I'm new. Uh, I've never been here. I just got washed out of Sear, so I'm just kind of unsure where my future lies. And he said, 
all right, well, I'll be seeing you in a few weeks. And I was like, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's a there's a moment. Uh, okay, if you, everyone take the next few minutes. Introduce yourself to your neighbors. See how they're doing. And uh, the commander of the 344th Training Squadron, which is enlisted air crew, came up to me and he said, you know, if you want to be something other than a, the cop, you come see me Monday morning. And sure enough, I came and saw him. Um, he interviewed two people that day, something about me he liked. It's like, just maybe just standing up in that crowd and, you know, willing to be vulnerable. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. And he helped me out. He got me like a class three flight physical, which is really hard Yeah. and basic. And, you know, I started, I think the next month to be a, a, a load master. Load master. Oh, right on. Yeah. How'd that yeah. go? Um, I was not a good student in high school. I was not a good student in college, but I wanted to. Uh, something clicked in my head where I wanted to be the best uh, student. So, man, I studied my ass off. Um, I don't know. It was just a weird feeling going through that sort of tech school. Um, but it, it went great. Yeah, you know, I got the um, I got the platform that I wanted. I wanted the C one thirty. Nice. And uh, I got uh, I wanted to be closer to special operations, even though I wasn't doing it per se. Yeah, yeah. So I, I volunteered to do the, the rescue um, variant, which was at the time part of ASOC. Okay. So, yeah. So I, I then I went to um, Jacksonville, Arkansas, Little Rock <laughs> Air Force Base for nine months. And that was a, that was a treat. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I had a um, squadron commander, or he was the tech school commander at the time. Um run into me a few years later after I became tac B and he's like, Oh man, I'm surprised you're still in the military. Oh, oh. Anyway. Why? Uh, so, what, what was, <laughs> what was the deal with that? I was, I was the guy who was like perpetually on, you know, you remember phases? Yeah. yeah. I don't think you had to. Yeah. So I was the guy who was like perpetually on phase one. Oh, I always okay. had to wear my uniform. I was always in trouble. And uh, <laughs> me and a friend, um, got rowdy in a, in the bowling alley on base. And they called the police. Um, and so as we're running out of the bowling alley, the police are storming in. And so we're <laughs> giggling all the way back to the uh, <laughs> the barracks. And we start wrestling. And for some reason, he pulled out a knife and he uh, cut my hand and he stabbed me in my leg. What? And yeah. This weird. is your buddy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my uh, God. I, I have no. <laughs> to this day, I don't know why he did it. He's, he was pretty drunk. Yeah, so I was probably some day. Hey man, I was wasted. I was like, "Hey man, you you stabbed me pretty good." And we both stand up and looked out at my leg, and the blood just goes through my jeans. Oh no! Yeah, so I had to go to the emergency room. So that was like an alcohol related incident, and the commander he remembers that that you know, I got oh, yeah. sent back in training. So um, yeah, even though it wasn't your fault, they still look fault. they they still frown on it because you were drunk. So like anything alcohol related. Regardless of what it, you could, you could be a total victim, but since you were drunk, they, they look bad. Yeah. yeah that's you should have, kind of a you bad should have way. Not stabbed. Been sta I don't know. Yeah. You should have been in that situation life. or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Whatever. Uh, yeah. So, but I, I made it. Um, so Arkansas was like kind of your general overall load master school. You, you learn how to pre-flight the aircraft, do weight and balance, um, load the aircraft. I struggled. I struggled. It, it seems pretty simple to do um i had trouble with that uh, yeah <laughs> you, you mean like loading pallets. uh like pallets and uh vehicles yeah. and stuff or? yeah okay. the airdrop stuff was good uh, but yeah loading loading the pallets making sure they're coming in straight and then um hooking up the parachutes for airdrop stuff uh but I, you know i made it and then the follow-on school for for afsoc uh like the mc-130s um and then the HC-130s was in Albuquerque. So I spent six months in Albuquerque oh, right on. Doing, doing training. Um, so graduated there. And then I my first duty station was Moody Air Force Base. Um, uh, did Spent two years there. I did a deployment out of there. So you had the option. You could do 30, 60, or 90-day deployments um, at the at the time. I don't know how you got to choose. I, you know, I wanted to stay. I wanted the experience. I was a senior airman at the time. Okay. So I did three months in Djibouti, Africa. Nice. Yeah, it was cool. That's uh, a different location than most uh, most people go to. Yeah, uh, I think the Navy had been there for for a very long time. 
yeah camp camp lemonier and they did like year year rotations there which uh at, at the time you could drink you could you mean like when you say navy you mean like soft navy or just regular navy guys just yeah okay regular swabbies they had uh uh, Navy guys, they had Marines. I didn't see many Army dudes there. Okay. Um, now, now it's pretty common. I think that the ST guys have been going there for for decades. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you could drink there. You could go downtown. Uh, yeah. How was that? Um, <laughs> it, it, it seems right. like they'd be a little hairy. <laughs> yeah, I, man, I didn't know. I didn't know any better. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. I'd have done the same thing. Especially yeah. as an E4, forget it. Oh, you can drink downtown. The I think we've talked about this, but the Navy guys would like stay overnight at some of the the bordellos. Yeah, that's bad and... business, man. <laughs> that's you're rolling the dice. Yeah, exactly. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, living living a little risky. Um, yeah. So I, I didn't do that. I I like did uh, snorkeling trips. It was like really cush. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but occasionally we would we, i think we would fly um twice a week we'd try to fly twice a week and um occasionally we'd have dudes uh, get on here because we were the rescue variant to, i was I was used to dropping pjs um free fall most of the time right but a couple times they do static line but I, I i was we were trained to do airdrop just like every other loadmaster so that was it was always a highlight but occasionally in Djibouti, we would get these dudes that come on the aircraft in civilian clothes, big beards, um, free fall rigs. And <laughs> I was always kind of set back by the, what, you know, their persona. Uh, I just, I wanted to do what they were doing. And they, sure. and they, they, uh, they worked in behind, beside, behind a fenced in area and we couldn't see through the fence. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I never know to this day who they were. I, I have some. You can probably guess. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure you can get, probably, yeah. yeah. So um, the only highlights from that trip, other than getting to work with those guys, was we never we never did it, but there was a mission um, to refuel some helicopters who were picking up people in Somalia, and then we would refuel the helicopters after they picked up the asset in Somalia. Oh, cool. we, yeah, we never did it, but. <laughs> Cool it was a cool thing that you could have done, almost done that. Could have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you okay, so it was a deployment. You, we were deployed. Did you do? Was it like a lot of real world stuff, or was it was it mostly just kind of training stuff for the guys who were operating in that area, or mm. or just were you kind of on call for like any kind of thing that would happen or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the rescue variant uh, will refuel has um has drogue hoses that come out of the wing. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, you know, we were, there, we were there to respond to any of the Navy aircraft that went down, possibly in the okay. doing doing their missions around the Horn of Africa. Right. Uh, and we were a rescue bird. A couple times we were asked to do fly to a certain area and do left-hand circles. Um, I think we were trying to um, imitate another aircraft. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's what they said. Uh, yeah. But, <laughs> I wonder which one that would be flying in circles. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> I have no no clue. <laughs> and it, Probably you know, kept people uh, indoors. I tell you that. And I'm sure that yeah. people were like less apt mm -hmm. to go out on the street and mess with our guys. So yeah, that's good. Uh, whoever thought of it was was smart. I mean, we looked just just like it. It's the same. Yeah, area, yeah. Just a few extra parts. But so we were we were there to rescue. We didn't. I didn't do any. I didn't transport people. Uh, I didn't transport cargo. We were there to assist with. Uh, with rescue so okay cool no i didn't rescue anybody so okay <laughs> right on yeah, yeah uh but but during that deployment i knew i wanted to cross train um just jumping pjs over the years and you know uh i would see them get jocked up um behind the aircraft with their rucksacks and their their fake weapons and their chest racks and it's like i want to i want to do something i want to contribute more so during that deployment, I put in my cross training package. Cross was that for training. Tech B at that time? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I got. I, I don't know how many of your people you've interviewed before have talked about Romad dot com. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think we touched on it really. There, I think J, uh, JT and I talked about it a little bit, um, but uh, but no, yeah. Go ahead, please. It, that was kind of a, a great wealth of knowledge. There used to be a lot of traffic on there. I haven't been on there in a, in a while, but yeah, that used to be like that message board was pretty pretty hot all the time. Yeah, that was like the hub, and that's what. You know, you pull it up and you see 
Pathfinder wings, your Ranger tab, your air assault badge, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. jump wings. So I'm like, oh, I want to do all that. I want right. to, you know, sniper <laughs> school. So like, um, and that was the only source of information I, I had at the time. I think maybe mm-hmm. MySpace was going on, but I wasn't a big Facebook guy, or, or it just wasn't. They didn't have the resources they have now to sure to that. So, yep. So I was like, that's what I want to do. I put in my package, and then I had my contract for the Air Force was coming up. I, I redeployed back to Moody Air Force Base. And my contract, I was a, well, no, I was a six-year enlistee, but I had spent so much time in in basic tech school. And so my contract was coming due and and I still hadn't heard back from the cross-training folks. So, uh, but uh, man, who was it? I don't know if, if I did speak with, um, he's about to retire, um, Stu. I won't use his last name. He's about to retire. He'd be a great guy to interview. I'll, I'll kind of go back. So, yeah, so I redeployed, um, and then I was close to the end of my contract. It was a six-year contract. That's what it was, yeah. And, That's then, I, we and then I eventually I started freaking out because I hadn't heard whether or not I was going to be able to cross-train. Call down to the schoolhouse. Um, Stu answers, um, and he's like, don't worry, man. Don't worry. Here's what <laughs> you bring. I, I, or no, I, and I eventually found out that I was accepted. But I had to leave in two weeks to go down to the schoolhouse to, to Florida. And I didn't know what to bring. I, I, I had no packing list or anything like yeah. that the first time. So I called down there and she was like, what? You're coming two weeks? Don't worry, man. Here's what you do. And he like <laughs> laid it all out and made me feel a lot better. So I, oh, good. Uh, uh, May. Yeah, May of 2008, I drove to Herbert Field, Florida to start tech school. Yeah. Um, they put you in the, in the really crappy dorms when you first got there. Um, and then they shark you or yet. Yeah. You get your, you get your PT uniforms. I I don't think we ever got, we must've been issued equipment and then they shark you. Um, Explain what sharking is. I don't don't know if everybody knows what that. Yeah. So JT uh, mentioned it too, but I, I I don't know if everybody knows what that is. So you have to feel free to, I think sharking or sharking is the tack fee term for an extended training day oh, okay. or a, a, a way to gut check or weed out the people who want to quit, which seems silly because you, you made all the effort to cross. Well, maybe it was for like the basic trainees who maybe just signed up, came to tech school straight out of basic or, or whoever. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's basically yeah. Like, a, like a smoke session. Like they just PT you until somebody yeah. quits or yeah. 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 Yeah, they PT you. Yeah, extended training day is like a nice way to put it, so you don't think you're being <laughs> hazed. Right. But yeah, six, you wake up super early, two, three in the morning, and then you run. Uh, you do grass and gorillas, which is another term for like just a lot of calisthenics, grass and gorillas. Yeah. And then they try to they try to the, all the tricks um, that you're aware of to to like mentally beat you down. They don't tell you how far you're running. Yeah. Or they're like okay, they kind of, you do a double time or you, you'd run fast in formation and then you are okay. And then they go back to marching and then they do double time again. Like you think it was over and, oh. <laughs> uh, and then, all right, guys, this was the, the morning shift. We're switching out. Here comes the, the afternoon shift. Good luck, fellas. And you're just like, ah, oh my God, <laughs> yeah. who wants to quit? And you, yeah, you remember the doc, there was a, other side of herbert there was that the sound and they had a dock and i i remember yeah they would have everyone face down and um on the dock and if you want to quit you know raise your leg and oh we got one there oh there's another one or you know um, I, nobody knows who, who quit there was uh, there was only one brian murray dang it I, he's got to be retired now brian murray was one of my instructors yeah, yeah. Um, and he good dude PTSD. real good dude He's so he he was a guy in in the book and talked about removing some guy's tooth, just the weird stuff you get asked to, or, or the things that you like, you have confidence in doing because of what the job brings you. you know, right. Like, I don't know how to do this, but I'll I'll step up and anyway. For sure. He he led our team. We had just been through field, which is the next to last phase before you start to graduate. But we we had finished field. I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit here, but he ran us through a PT session that I'll never forget in my life. That was it was rough? Fun. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, I don't know if I was like full of myself, like uh, like uh, this is going to be easy. Um, I, I've got it in the bag. I'm going to graduate. But they had these old Vietnam flak vest 
that they'd make us put on and then they had this weighted it was like a big pipe um really long pipe and it had chains um all up and down it at different intervals to allow people to stagger on either side and grab the chains and you'd run with this pipe with the flak vest on and okay i don't know how far we ran we ran a really long way and it was i don't know mentally i didn't i didn't want to quit but i I, that'll always stand out as like one of the hardest pt sessions ever um everyone's throwing up (laughs) i I don't know i don't know it was really tough (laughs) that's the one i remember everything else was was hard but um that one always stands out running with that big pipe with the flak vest on helmet kit um I don't know if it was hot, like super hot that day, or maybe I wasn't mentally in the right spot, but, um, yeah. Brian yeah, you could have been having a bad day or, you know, could have just been like, I mean, it was towards the end. So, you know, you're, you get those thoughts in your head, like, man, do I need to do this? Is, is this for me really? You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> uh, but he was, he was really cool. And, you know, I was, I was senior airman at the time, super nervous to, to talk to him. Um, Brown was his last name. He was, he was Ranger Tab guy. Man, and we had a dude named, his first name was Lindsey. Uh, all, all the instructors, phenomenal. They, they played the role, right? The instructors have to play that, that persona and that role. But after sure. you graduate uh, or you see him later on in your career, you know, you realize that you're just a normal person. And, and they're always uh, super, super nice to us and gave sure. a lot of good advice. But Th- those are the those are the, that kind of first kicked off my impression of what tactics could do or what type of men they were, uh, and it was a solid solid impression of because uh, every one of my instructors had been a part of SOF. I think that's what it was. Like, yeah, they had done either rotation with Ranger or with SF, so added a lot of credibility to what they were telling us and what they're sure us, so. sure sure. Um, yeah, graduated tech school. And then signed out of Moody and drove, ruined my truck, hauling all my stuff. But I drove from. Uh, oh, so Moody wait a minute. Airport. So you you went to, okay. So so the cross training you went from you drove down there kind of like TDY to go to tech school. Yeah. Essentially, okay. Because like a lot of us when we like we first came in to go to tech school, you know that was our that was our duty assignment. So we just PCS there. But you okay? So you went to Mo- you went from Moody down there and then you went back and packed all your stuff and then. Yeah moved to you where's your first duty assignment i was at fort carson okay um, colorado yeah 13th asos which was <clears throat> i didn't know it at the time but a phenomenal um assignment m- based mostly on the people that were there like currently or had been there for maybe a year or two yeah so so i drive i can't remember um he's he's out of the military now dallas pipes was my his great great name yeah um, yeah <laughs> Is that his real name? <laughs> yeah, yeah, his real name's Dallas Pipes. So you're thinking like this fucking huge studly dude, but uh, pro wrestler or something? Yeah, average, <laughs> average looking guy. He's a realtor now. Oh, okay. Uh, Dallas Pipes was my sponsor. Uh, you know, brings me in. So we set up the first day that I'll show up, and so I'm a senior airman. I I just got my beret. I, I don't have any. All I have is tech school, and I you know, yeah. loadmaster. So I show up. And they say, hey, meet here at Butts Army Airfield. A lot of innuendos you can throw in. Dallas Pipes, Butts Army Airfield. But anyway, I show up there. <laughs> 13th ASOS had relocated, I think, about a year ago to, to out to the airfield. And they had um, they had office space in the hangar with the OH-58 Deltas. They, nice. they had office space on the second floor. And it was shitty. It was oh. terrible. <laughs> it was run down i don't know when it was built. it was kind of like the t-dome here like built in the 50s and uh-huh. they're just like uh you guys have this hall so it, anyway I'm, I'm going in the commander's office so you were like i can only imagine what you're thinking like coming from a like a flying squadron in the air force yeah. usually has some pretty good stuff you know if not the best uh and <laughs> so you went from that to an old the old school Dang tech it. p where the way we used to be it was like yeah. run down yeah I it was on an army post. Yeah, on an army post. I was like, well, this is how it's gonna be. I, maybe I liked it. Maybe I. Uh, it's probably well, like a cool change. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm like gritty. Now, yeah. yeah, I'm like tough now. <laughs> yeah. So I show up and uh, man, Crunk. Um, do you know him? 
Who is it? What's it? Crunk. Uh, that's, that's what he goes by. Um, no, I don't think so. He's in the office ahead of me. I sh- I'm showing up with all my paperwork. And Crunk is, man, he's like six foot five, just a giant of a man. And he <laughs> is in between. Uh, in between schools because he was trying out to she's trying to cross her in the cct okay so i'm standing in the office with this giant of a man talking about having to go to i don't know if it's airborne school or air traffic control school or something like that I was like, oh man what did i get myself into <laughs> just uh just super intimidating i was like oh, yeah, yeah. Just trying to trying to get the job done uh but but some of the people that i got to inter- got to interact with there over my five years kind of really set the tone for what sort of tech P and J tech I was going to be and what I wanted to aspire to. Yeah. So I'm trying to think if there's, I don't think there's anyone now, especially with um, Barbie um, getting out recently. Yep. Yep. So I had guys like um, uh, Brett Barbie, uh, Nishimoto, Cam Rollison, um, TB, who's, who's still active duty. Um, dang it, I can't think of his name. Uh, Alex Royal, who's out now. Um, but all of those guys, solid guys. Yeah, man. Yeah. So those are all the guys solid who guys. Were training me or um, Brett Barbie. He had been to several shooting courses, and we weren't doing anything. So he like he gathered everybody up and did an impromptu uh, two day shooting course in the winter time in Colorado. I'm like, man, that's nice. Really cool. <laughs> um, you know, never my wild. I don't know. I just it was it's just impressed at their drive and motivation and, and intelligence. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that kind of set the tone um, of where I where I knew I wanted to be. Um, but but yeah, you know, I got there in I think August of 2008, and I had time to get a combat mission ready, um, certified with. He's out now, but his name was uh, Scott O'Doherty. He was my trainer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got CMR, uh, do you remember your CMR check ride? Not really. Um, uh, I know it was pretty extensive, but, um, but yeah, that was a, that was a while ago. I heard horror stories about it from, from the JTEC that I was paired up with, uh, ha- having to rewire the jerk 26 was the, was the huge Humvee radio. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it has about a uh, hundred wires in your gas mask or in your mop four gear. Uh, saying, I, like, oh, I mean i never did in pro gear but we we did that quite a bit like we, they were just like they'd walk in and uh for those who don't know that the, the, there's it's a pallet of radios there's like four or five radios and they have cables everywhere and what they would do is they'd walk in and they would just take all the cables off and just let them hang and then you had to like go in there and figure out and, and a lot of them were, were kind of easy because they could only fit in one place but some of them had like um were like maybe the same connection or something but yeah it was it was challenging. I mean, and yeah. I mean, it was it was a daunting task for sure. Yeah, I know. Is that I, what you kind of experienced? Or no, that's what I heard about though. I was like, oh, oh <laughs> yours was a little easier. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, okay, like mentally preparing myself to like do this in Mop Four and push a Humvee. But I don't think my CMR check ride was was all that difficult. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. It was a yeah. different time though. I mean, like there was no war going on when I was in. You know, so it was like. And, you know, we were all just kind of like kind of trying to figure it out. I think, but I think yours was more purpose driven. You know what I mean? Like, you're, like I need to get this guy CMR. I don't need to mess with him. I need him to know this information because he's probably going to combat here pretty soon. You know what I yeah. mean? So they, maybe that was the, the mentality. Like they could mess with us a lot more because there was no, there's really no stakes. You know, stakes. There, it wasn't yeah. like if the guy screws it up, big deal. I'll just retrain him. You know, he's not getting ready to go out the door or anything. But yeah. for you, in your situation, yeah, they might have. They might have been like, all right, let's let's do it. let's play it straight. Let's get this guy trained, and that way we get him out the door as soon as possible. Maybe I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, you're you. I think I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. No one mess around. Let's get this guy the knowledge that he needs. Yeah, because shortly shortly thereafter, I I, uh, I deployed. Um, yeah. First time. Um, I think it was June, June of 2009. I did a six month deployment to, um. Bob Blessing. It's gone through a couple name changes, or yeah, had gone through a couple name changes. Um, but yeah, June 2009. So like, like in in preparation for that deployment, I got CMR qualified, and then and then we got our assignments because we were they were still sending guys to Iraq at the time. Yeah. But they would sit at the the desk at the brigade headquarters and maybe control. Um, 
you know, I don't really know what they were doing. Just kind of presence patrols in Iraq. So nobody wanted to go to Iraq at this time, 2009. Everyone wanted to go into Afghanistan because I believe in 2007 or maybe it was 2009, there was a big um, push or, or influx of troops. So okay. I, I just can't, my dates are messed up with, with that sort of stuff. But Me too. bottom line, yeah. everyone, if you were squared away and you were, you were doing well, you got picked to go to Afghanistan. Okay. So, so I got picked. So in the lead up to it, man, I had a, he's also retired. His name is Herbie Clinton, Clinton J. Herberson the third. Yeah. Um, great dude. Yeah. Man, he was, uh, he was awesome. And he, he had showed up to Fort Carson the same time I did. And for some reason we were in the same flight, uh, and we hung out together. So he, he was my JTAC and I was super fortunate because he had done a number of deployments beforehand to Afghanistan. He'd worked with SF guys before. Um, and a phenomenal JTEC. He, I think he was one of the guys, first guys to go through weapon school. Oh, okay. Uh, for JTEC. Yeah. Just wow. His accent throws you off. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but incredibly a Southern boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So t- he's like, hey, Fullwood, we need to go talk to the, um, the battalion that we're deploying with and we need to learn their SOPs. We need to figure out who's who on the block and um this is this is what we're supposed to do so that was kind of like my introduction like true integration like hey guys we're going to be deploying with you guys uh what's your sop and sure enough they had a little book of sops and how they ran battle drills yeah and then that um it was 212 infantry um they were being fielded it was a it was an initiative called lighten the soldiers load where instead of just issuing the because they knew that this um, this group were going to go to the Kunar Valley, where it's just mountains everywhere. Yeah. Um, so they're like, we was it to... was that unit mechanized, or were they light, or what? What kind of light infantry? Were they? Light infantry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Light, so fourth ID, um, light infantry. They weren't. Okay. Yeah. Um, so walking, they're on foot or Humvees, or yeah, if if you're lucky. Yeah. They so they'd switch to. You had to walk everywhere, but if they wanted to drive between fobs and cops along the Pesh River Valley Road, they would use MRAP. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so they had they started an initiative called Light and Soldier Load. They started getting guys um, the Arteryx knee pads and um, a, a couple like lightweight camping stuff. Um, even though like nobody was camping outside, I, I didn't care. I I, I still got it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Right. Um, and then, then our uh, Clint called me up on the phone. He's like, "Hey, man, me." And so we we would go in um, two man teams, but you know, paired together. So four guys total went to this fob. So it was um, Clint and myself, and then Joel. I think he's still active duty, so I'll, I'll use his first name. So Joel and uh, this guy Gregory Moulton was was our other counterparts, and that we had all decided that there was a vest out there it was acu pattern i've given it away now but it was a lighter vest it was a plate carrier essentially okay so um so we went and bought our own plate carrier and uh and then we had it headed out which is uh, crazy because that it's always been an issue i can't believe it's still an, it was an issue in 08 or 09 but that was it's always been an issue it's like body armor and, and personal protective gear not necessarily for army guys they kind of had they kind of did okay it wasn't the best by any means but tack p's kind of had to a lot of beg borrow and steal to get yep. like the kind of gear you really needed yeah they gave you something but it was like is this flak vest really going to do anything for me if i get shot with a you know ak or something no it's not you know yeah. whatever but yeah so anyway to your point that it, it's i hated it that people had to go out and buy their own gear but everybody did it there was there was it run it was running rampant in that in our career field was people just buying newer gear better gear just so they felt prepared when they went down range. But I, I think, uh, I think it wasn't, it wasn't so much like the cool factor as it was, like you're saying, like stuff that'll help me survive a little bit sure. better or blend in or like not stand out. Right. Um, or just something that was comfortable. Like we, you know, you'd walk everywhere. You had to walk everywhere. So like if you're, if you're drained from wearing the RBAV, um, with your, which is like a bigger protect- system, well, I think it was, uh, you know, it's evolved over the years, right? But it was designed to be like quickly uh, taken off in an emergency. If you rolled over and were in water and you had to take it off, it had like a, a lot of 
uh, plate carriers had that sort of mechanism on it, but like a quick release to get yeah, it get it off. It yeah, mantra. And and another guy, um, I'll just I'll use his first name, Adam. He's recently got out of the military, but um, he was also stationed there, and he did a video of him wearing the the system that we were issued and like pointing out all of the deficiencies and. You know, I was just kind of, it was not the fact that he was doing it, but the fact that he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to fix this. Yeah. So it was kind of that attitude that was pervasive in that unit. Sure. Um, so, yeah. So we fly into um, Kyrgyzstan. I can't remember the base that was there. My helmet broke in Kyrgyzstan. Oh. So I had to, uh, nobody had backups, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, Clint gave me a, he had a backup helmet that he'd gotten in some of those pictures. And I still, I wore, I wore that helmet my whole, every conventional deployment was the one that he gave me. Wow. It didn't, didn't fit quite well, but that's all I had. That's better than nothing. Yeah. <laughs> better, better than nothing. So yeah. So we, we fly into Bagram from Kyrgyzstan and then from Bagram, uh, there's, a, there's another intermediary between Bagram. I'll, I'll think of it here in a, in a few minutes, but. Anyway, from there, you have to fly in helicopter at night um, to Fob Blessing, which was named after a 275 Ranger who got killed by an IED. Um, so you fly in. I remember because it was daytime, we had our um, guys that we were going to work with meet us on the LZ to help us with our bags. And so we're flying in, chucking bags off the 47. And the Romad, he was a guard guy, Romad grabbed me, helped me with the bags, and I kind of ask him how missions were going. He's like, dude, it's wild, man. I was like, in a firefight and I was chucking grenades at people. And I was like, oh man, what did I get myself into? <laughs> you know, I'm looking around and there's huge mountaintops towering over, uh, over our fob, which is in a, in a low ground right next to the valley. So yeah, that was kind of my first, first impression. They took, take us over to the house. It's, um, Afghan made, mud it was it was fairly large but it was like a it was a mud house mm -hmm. that they that they kept uh kept all the guys in and it had uh what do they call them those air conditioners chicos okay they had, yeah <laughs> they had chicos the size of your desktop computer uh, which they did nothing one on either end they did nothing and it was <laughs> right. the summertime in, in the kunar province so uh yeah so that was kind of the first impressions. And I remember, I remember, uh, how hot it was in that building. Like you couldn't, I had, I had trouble. So I had to like take a cold shower before I went to bed. I had to soak my t-shirt in water and then put the t-shirt on just to like get some sort of sleep. It was yeah, yeah. miserable. Yeah. Horrible, uh, horrible conditions. <laughs> we had, I don't miss uh, that at all. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that kind of, you know that that set the bar for like discomfort for me so yeah, yeah um sat phones we were given our team was given a sat phone so we could call home occasionally um and those are the days we had you know you had internet but you had to wait in line to, right. to like email they would have a soldier at the at the mwr and if you stayed out the the fob the fob went dark right you don't want any lights highlighting your position so if you stayed in the internet cafe um, which was more than, than most people got. Cause we were at a fob, not a, not a combat outpost or a cop mm -hmm. or a company outpost, whatever, whichever way it goes. Yeah. But if you stayed in, you know, if it, if it got dark while you're in there and you didn't have your headlamp, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. It was so yep. dark. I always I remember that how dark you put your hand up and you couldn't see anything. And you're like, I'm fucked now. Cause I got to walk all the way back to my hooch <laughs> and I don't know where I am. You have no idea where, yeah, you can't yeah. find it. I, I actually walked out of a hooch. I did that one time and I, I, uh, it was dark and I didn't have my headlamp. I was fumbling with it, trying to get it on, but I was still walking and I smacked right into like a, a Connex box and like, I had to get stitches in my head because, I, <laughs> because I, it was so dark. I mean, like you could uh, not, you're, like you said, you could not see your hand in front of your face. Nope. Yeah. 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 You, you'll, you'll never be in a place darker than that. I think, uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's, you're just like shuffling, like inching your feet forward with your hands out like this yeah, 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 like, exactly. they had a <laughs> they had a parade ground just just outside of the uh outside of the mwr and it had a drop off it had like a three-foot drop off into the playground there 
<laughs> you'd hear them at night, people with their big uh, cruiser, you know, their saws because they carry yeah, a yeah. weapon everywhere. Ooh, just, <laughs> <laughs> weapon just fall over the place. It's just falling off that three three foot lip, fucking oh. themselves up, man. Yeah. So so Clint and Joel and I, we would do shifts in the talk when we weren't when we weren't doing missions. A lot of and a lot of stuff happened. While we were there, I, I wrote it all down here. So before before we got there, we heard of Cop Wanat being overrun. I don't know if you're familiar with, with that. No. Um, they didn't do a movie about that, but they it, it was just another one of those in a really poor poor position, advantageous yeah. for the enemy in a low ground, and it got overrun. And that um, location was, um, you know, a few kilometers from where Fob Lesson was. Okay. So like I, I was pretty cognizant of that. I heard of that story. Man, a lot of stuff happened there in that deployment. Um, Bo Bergdahl walked off the fob during during that rotation. Oh, off your fob. That was you no, were there when he did that. Oh no, no, no okay, no, his own fob. It just, yeah, it just happened while I was there. Gotcha. We were controlling. We had F-15s at the time um, during that a lot of that rotation, but all of our assets got pulled from us. They're like, oh, yeah. there's, a, there's a dust one. I was like, what the fuck does dust one mean? <laughs> Yeah, destination unknown. I'd have to look it up. Have yeah, to yeah. Fact check that. But anyway, so I remember that happening, <clears throat> and the 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 teams that were there at the Kunar, the FOB, which was which was seen as really cushy um, for that area. Uh, there's three teams there. One team would do a rotation to the Korangal, and then they would do a month there, and they would kind of get rotated out with another JFAT team. And um, there was a there was a guard team in the Korangal when we showed up there and I, I guess I'll just spell this right now me and Clint never never got to go to the Korangal something always would come up when it was our turn to go in there so we, we were close by there and we worked with people that that did it um, but never got to go in the Korangal which was was a little bit disappointment considering the the movie that they made yeah um, but uh, we would always get picked to do we would Clint and I would drive with a with a small convoy to some of the smaller outposts when they needed when we would do some missions uh, into the village like clearance operations and stuff like that. So we would drive, we would stay the night, and then we would walk out with them. And then typically they would walk out of the gate, and they would walk and just walking three k through the mountains would just break you off. Yeah, uh, man, it was so terrible. Brutal. Yeah, it was, that's the worst was, walking I ever did besides the jungle. Oh, the, the mountains of Afghanistan were yeah, horrible. It was terrible. You couldn't, you could never bring enough water. Um, mm, right. So it was so hot. We so hot and dry and sw- you just, yeah. So you, yeah. So you walk all night and, um, one of the, one of the big ones that we did, I can't remember the name of the Valley, but it's where operation bulldog bite took place. That's a really interesting, um, operation. If, if you ever get a chance to look at that, but, we did. It was a. Uh, it was both our JTAC teams left out of Cop Michigan or Cop Hunter Miracle. We walked all night, and then we split. Um, two forces split. One went in the village, and then one was in Overwatch. And I was with Clint in Overwatch. Um, with a with a platoon. Yeah, I was the row man. I was the junior guy. So my responsibility was to be. I, I would get get touch with higher. I would have a, a satellite radio establish our position and then request additional cast assets if we needed it. And then yeah. on top of that, you know, I was a rifleman, wasn't, wasn't a very good one, but I was a rifleman. <laughs> and then I have the old one to 50 map that we would, we'd laminate before we go out and I would mark everyone's positions. So when Clint was controlling cast and he would, you know, we would, we would just double up. I would be listening to, and I would be just his backup. Right. Yeah, like deconflicting friendlies and making sure that, yeah, you knew yeah. where everybody was. Yeah. Yeah. So if he had any questions, like if they were going to employ, which um, the the other team, which was in the village clearing, they got, they got not ambushed, but they, they started taking a lot of fire. And uh, Joel was with them. Joel and his Romad were with them down in the village. And Joel was controlling, um, controlling fighters and, and cast. And Belgian F-16s showed up because – during those conventional missions, you know, the whole country of Afghanistan was busy at the time. So you didn't have dedicated cast assets when you went outside. You had to request right. over the over the JARN joint air request net. So yep. that was kind of our response. The tough part was 
remembering what kill box keypad you're in. I had no idea. I had to do it to <laughs> right. figure out with that. Anyway, Belgian F-16s show up. Joel does this like really long cast brief because the guys aren't copying or they're, and they're speaking, you know, their English is... I was going to say, yeah. There's not, was it the language barrier language. was kind of a breaking it down a little bit? But some guys had a really hard time. Um, he ended up dropping a bomb and I... <laughs> It looked like it was a smoke bomb. You could see it impact, and then it literally the shell casing tumbled, tumbled down the hill, and smoke coming out of it. It was really, yeah, it was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. And Joel, was it like a dud or something? Yeah, yeah, must it was a, it was a dud. Uh, yeah. So Joel was like, "You guys got to go." So they left, <laughs> and Apache showed up. Well, nice. Um, army, the army was controlling the Apaches. Yeah, the army was controlling the Apaches. Um, there was weird relationships back then. We're like, hey, this is an army asset, so the army forward, forward observers will control this. We're like, yeah, okay, we don't, we don't prefer that, but okay. Um, and they were passing them fire missions, and in the meantime, we had called for QRF because the the Joel's force was pinned down. So we called for QRF, and they showed up in MRAPs down the valley, and they dismounted and they started climbing started climbing the other ridge line to kind of flank this Taliban team. Um, and part of that QRF were some Marine, I don't know what ETT stands for, but I think an engagement training team, but they'd have small pockets of Marines training to Afghans. Okay. They had, had some Marines and they had reporters with them, civilian reporters with them. So they start um, maneuvering up this one side of the ridge line and Joel was down in the low ground and the Apaches are, are doing gun runs uh, around this house. And I'm listening to it on the fires net. And uh, I hear the Apaches say, hey, I got movement on this ridge line. I'm in hot. And that was it. And sure enough, he started, they started, they engaged the Marines and the reporter um, coming up this other, other side of the ridge line. What the hell? Uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. I, I think the Army guys initially passed a, a one fire mission. And then the Apaches just bit off on the movement on one yeah, ridge yeah. line over, moving up. Hey, I got movement. I'm in hot. And 30 Mike Mike shot the antennas off the Marines back. Whoa. And then, but blew the, blew the leg off the reporter. Oh my God. <laughs> it was, it was nuts. Uh, they told him to, to cease fire. I think they stayed overhead just for noise. Um, but Joel and his Romad ended up helping, ca helping carry back this reporter on the litter somehow they i think he ran up to get him or helped run up and get him and uh joel's like man the reporter was just like why why did you do this to me i was like oh man that's pretty sad yeah it's horrible <laughs> it sucks man you know you, you're here to report stuff on afghanistan and get your legs blown off by uh, i mean it's, it's kind of the nature of the beast though i mean he he had to know what he was getting into well you know he he yeah. volunteered to go out with the, i'm not it's a horrible thing to happen but i mean he's just as vulnerable as all of us. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's crazy that, yeah. I mean, I wonder if the, the Apache, because sometimes they think of themselves as a separate element anyway, like a maneuver unit. So I wonder if they're like, nah, we got this. We don't really need control it, or I don't know, man. It's weird. It was close. Like it was close. The, the, the problem was, you know, I, I, I haven't lost any sleep over this, but the problem was, you know, maybe the army's the guy who the FO who was controlling the Apaches, you know, he's heads down, he's getting shot at. Yeah. Um, and then the QRF was probably not talking to him on the radio, kind of doing their own thing. So he didn't know or didn't advise him. So, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of things you can pick it apart, but you know, nobody really lost any too much sleep over. I never heard what become of it. Um, maybe I was just yeah. too young or I, I really didn't care, but it, I'll just never forget, you know, hearing the traffic of the Apache come in and say, Oh yeah, I'm in hot. I was like, Oh man. I well, as soon as you he, said that, I was like, man, does he mean your ridge line or the other guy's ridge? Yeah. I was thinking that it was going to be your ridge line, which it could have been. It could have very yeah. easily been your ridge yeah. line is theirs, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's the, that's, see, that's the issue. And you kind of alluded to it before about how the Army wanted to keep control of the Apaches. But when you, you, you guys are the air, you guys are in charge of that airspace. So, like, essentially, you probably should have had control of those. Apaches, just be, yeah. just for deconfliction purposes. In case Clint had any, you know, fixed wing aircraft overhead, he would have had to deconflict those air 
those aircraft right. anyway. So, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And I, you know, I ran into it. Um, we actually talked about it um, during my assessment. And oh, we did. Like, yeah, when you're the cadre, I ran into this, <laughs> a similar situation in 2012. Yeah, um, which ended up going my way uh, in a good way. But so that, that was like my first exposure to real world fratricide, and it kind of leaves yeah. a huge imprint on your mind as the guy who's who's tasked to um, coordinate. And, sure. and liaise and deconflict and, and do all that to keep guys on the ground safe. So that was left a huge impression on me, uh, maybe more so than the videos they show you in tech school because they, you know, they um, show you all these frat, you know, fratricide videos. I think we talked about it once at work. The um, uh, again, the Apaches killing dudes in the in the armored personnel carrier in Iraq and shit like that. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that was a that was a memorable mission. Let's see, there's there's a lot of things that happened that when I look back, um, I'll tell you I'll tell you about one instance that I I wasn't a part of, but I had friends um, involved in it, which turns out they made a movie about the the outpost. Have you heard of that one? I think I yeah. asked you about it. Yeah, um, they had a they had a platoon from FOB from the FOB I was at um, get get QRF to go support. Um, cop Keating that was overrun that they, they made the movie the uh, outpost about huh. they they didn't let us go the JTAC um, I think they had another JTAC team uh, my buddy um, Adam Burns I can't remember, can't remember the romance name um, anyway they, they got they got picked to go and help help those guys who are getting overrun but um, that happened while I was there cop Keating got overrun but I remember sitting on the HLZ watching that platoon load up on the 47 to, to go support um, that cop. And, the, you know, you never really remember what people say, but you remember how they say it. And the battalion commander was given his, his guys uh, put the wood to him speech like, hey, you got Americans out here just got overrun. You guys are going to go save them. Um, I don't remember exactly the words, but just, just his persona, his nonverbals. Yeah. Man, it was getting me fired up, and I wish I was on that aircraft. <laughs> I was like, "All right, I'll go back to my hooch. I can't go." So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's it's uh, um, it's a really good movie. It's yeah, it's weird watch. they didn't bring one of you guys with you with them. I mean, it seems like it'd be helpful. I know there was one already in there, but yeah, I mean, why? I don't know. Why it's not? just a different mentality, I think, for the big <laughs> army. Some know the value of a JTAC, and others not that not that they don't they either don't know or i don't know what it is but sometimes they don't realize the the capabilities you know that we, we can bring to them so yeah yeah it's odd how they would ever leave a jtac behind if i had the option i would always bring a jtac which is you know with the rangers it, i it, it, whether it be us or an army ranger jtac you know it, there's always a jtac somewhere in the mix to to yeah. control all those fires and I, the big army sometimes doesn't do that i think I mean, in their defense, I mean, usually a big army unit has enough organic capability that they can defend themselves, but yeah. they, not always. You know, sometimes it gets to the point where they need some closer support. So, I yeah, uh, I think maybe they feel that the thirteen foxes, the fire observers, can supplement or or for sure. provide provide targeting information. Uh, but man, it was it was hard. It was hard for those yeah. guys. Um, some of them were good. Some of them were really good, but uh, yeah, uh, Operation Bulldog Bite. I keep kind of going back to that one, but it, it's infamous for big clearance operation in, in that valley north of uh, the Pesh River Valley, where you know whole squads were getting wiped out. And it, it's it's infamous for uh, the Air Force because they had a PJ and a Crow um, in it fast work, but they got hoisted down and they they picked up. Uh, uh, there's a book about it. Um, yeah, by the by the PJ. Anyway, we can probably cut that one out. But yeah, they didn't have a JTAC, and I'm 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 asking myself, I was like, why didn't they have a JTAC? It could have yeah. solved a lot of their issues. But yeah, um, which anyway, kind of goes yeah. back to that uh, how they're um, what's the um, the the guardian angel tech P? What is? Aren't they starting to? The they're they, they stop that, or they they're starting to? I mean, I know they're trying to put tech P's with with PJ oh, units or guardian oh, guardian angel oh. guys. I mean, I just I just saw that on a on the tax tax. Yeah, I think they're, they're either trying to do it or they have done it or I don't know what it is, but I think they makes have sense. I mean, open. yeah, 
They they have slots open, but they've been talking about that since I since I went over to TACP and probably even yeah. before, like putting TACP in rescue units or Yeah. Um, I mean I get, it'd be beneficial, I guess. Yeah. I get airsick. So that kind of dissuaded <laughs> me. Get, getting stuffed in a sixty. Um that kind of dissuaded me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was a big one. Cop Keating happened while I was there. And then about the time that we were tasked to go, you know, there was a potential for Clint and I to go into the Korngal to do a rotation there. There was a um, there was a village that had gotten taken over by the Taliban. And, you know, this, th- that happens frequently. But what was important about this village was the, so had the, the mayor or the provincial governor had familial ties to Karzai. So they sent in American troops, American troops to take the town back. So there was no, there was no fob. There was no cop. It was like a town. Um, and they, they came in, seized some important buildings that were running operations out of buildings. And one of them was a, was a girl's school next to a river. It was like an L shaped building next to a river. And this had been, they had, they had seized the, the army had seized territory and, and seized a foothold and fortified. I think it was two buildings in this town, uh, and they pushed everyone outside of town. But uh, they had a lot of issues with snipers in the area. Oh, okay. So uh, Tony Tony Rios, I think, was one of the first guys to go in to help them out, and then Clint and I were like the the backfill. They couldn't they couldn't solve the snipers. They had to rotate dudes out, so Clint and I got flown in that night, and the the town was called Barge Matal. Um, so we show up there, hey, we're in big old rucksacks, and we stayed there for about a month. Wow. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was um, it was a long. I thought it was a long time to be living out of a, a girls' school. Um, we show up there, uh, and then and then you get three lines of cast every day and 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 this was like this was the hot spot at the time or the the month or whatever Mm -hmm. so they brought in i don't know if they were part of dev grew officially but they brought in some seals um they had a they had a pj with them okay uh they just showed up one day and they're like hey um we're gonna be doing our own thing at night but we're gonna sleep here during the day sure enough like (laughs) at, at night they would walk out the front gate and they would, I, I was told, I never really interacted with it. I talked to their JTAC a little bit, but um, they would like hide in houses and try to like ambush folks. And then they would come back and sleep during the day. Huh. Uh, we did <laughs> it. Yeah, it was, it was um, a little surreal. I'm like, what? Yeah. They had, they had MP7s and uh, all sorts <laughs> of crazy Gucci gear. Um, they had, man, and we were talking about that general dynamic laptop that really yep. small one and they weren't using it. The JTAC wasn't using it. So he let us use it. It had Falcon view on it. And we, we got flown in, um, some sort of, uh, acoustic, uh, micro uh, device that, that could hear the shots and triangulate where the shot for the snipers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we would, when we somehow plug that into the, or we would get the readout and it'd give a range and bearing from where it was at. I would plot those throughout the day the range and bearings to where we're all we're hearing all these sniper shots. And then, you know, I'd get like a general area. And then when the cast would check on, we just, you know, we try to find the guy, right. But they, they use all sorts of cover and concealment. So we just bomb the hell out of these hillsides and it was surrounded on all four sides of these huge mountains. So we're just dropping bombs all day on all these hillsides. Nice. Yeah, it was cool. Um, yeah, I spent 30 days there. Uh, we had put tarps, all along there was the hallway and we were sleeping in the rooms but we had hang tarps up on the hall so the snipers couldn't see us walking to and forth but they'd still take pot shots and they got almost got one of the seals that hit like a post behind them and exploded the wood and <laughs> we're all laughing God, that had to be nerve-wracking man yeah. for like a month you're just like uh, you don't even know when they're gonna shoot or, i mean just the whole time it was like yeah. that you wouldn't you wouldn't go you wouldn't go in the open yeah you would you'd like yeah, you'd have to stay behind the tarps. That was it. And oh, that's, that's the funniest part. So like, um, <laughs> there's the they had a bathroom, but they don't have bathrooms in Afghanistan. It's literally stalls with holes in the floor. Sure. And, yeah. So yeah. 
but there was a there was a gap um, that was open between where we were kind of obscured from the sniper to the building, but there's a wide open space that you had you had to literally like run in between or you'd get to, to take a shit. So um Jeez. Yeah, for for a month. Um <laughs> God. Yeah. We would we would get rocketed all the time. Um RPGs. You get and snipers were the worst thing because you'd never know. Sure. Um but the the PJ who was with that SEAL team, we were getting shot at one day and he was like I don't know what he was doing, but he had his suppressed weapon. And he was uh, sitting behind some cover out in the open. He's like, oh, I think I see him. He's just dumping shots in the Start mountain. Shooting. With his, yeah, with his M4. I'm like, I don't know, man. Uh, <clears throat> and it, but, uh, it didn't stop after that, I assume. No, no, he, he didn't. Uh, he didn't have an effect, surprisingly. <laughs> yeah. But but they had they had little um, fighting positions on either side. And, you know, if you got bored while you're there, because you know, you're not going anywhere. Right. So you kind of sit in the fighting positions and you'd, you'd have a spotting scope and see if you can see anything. And one of the, and one of the army guys, uh, he's like, Oh, I think I see him. I was like, man, you're full of shit, dude. Yeah. <sighs> Big old explosion next to the sandbag next to him. He's like, yep, I got him now. The, the army dude didn't even move. Had a huge explosion in the sandbag right next to him. He didn't even flinch. He's like, what is it? A sniper bullet? Yeah. Had, yeah oh, okay. Sniper, yeah. I was like, oh, he's like, oh, I got him. I got him. Jeez, <laughs> steely-eyed killer, man. Yeah, Good like, lord. Man. Yeah, I was like, what the fuck, man? Do you guys uh, take him out? You never know. You never know. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I don't even think he had a gun. I think he just had a spotting scope and was like looking for him. It, it was very oh, okay. surreal. That's um, crazy. They brought in uh, Latvian JTACs. They brought in Latvian snipers to do like counter sniper stuff. Um. I told you one of the one of the Latvians got shot. He got he, as he was getting medevaced. His buddy was laying down, suppressive fire in some random direction. He got yeah. shot in the ass. Oh my god! Came out his dick. So he. Got, oh, that's he right. Got, yeah, he got. Oh. He got put back on the. He got put back on the helo with his buddy. Uh, people are just screaming. Oh, oh no, no, yeah, it was. Uh, yep, yeah, I. I Sorry, let me back up. <laughs> <clears throat> we we're, were just sitting in the fighting position. I'm on the spotting scope looking. I don't see anything. I don't know what I'm looking for either. I'm just looking. Sure. This is people. Yeah, but... uh, Dan, the Latvian JTAC, takes my spot in the fighting position and is looking. And you just hear a shot and you hear Dan screaming. He was the guy who got shot. Broke his, got shot in the collarbone. So we're medevacking him out. And that's when his buddy... I was laying down fire and got shot. Laying too. down fire, he got shot in the ass. Jeez. And it was it was madness, and you'd you'd hear because you'd have interpreters with you, and they would tune into the Taliban's channel, and you can hear them um, talking about overrunning you or having fire bombs or mortars or uh, real cordless rockets shooting at you. So it was wild. Um, it had to be, like I said, it had to be just nerve wracking, just like on edge all the time, like. You know, because you don't know. I mean, yeah, it could be BS or it could be real. You don't know, so you have to take everything seriously. I mean, man, yeah. oh man. You, you and you felt really confined. Like you didn't want to go out in the open because you thought you were going to get shot. Um, sure. And people did get shot. Um, and, but there was a unit. The guy owns. I try. I reached out to him when I had Instagram. He has a T-shirt company. I don't know his name. I don't know who he was, but I know that he was part of a platoon that got brought in there to help do missions at night as well, kind of offset the seals. Um, everyone in that platoon had a purple heart and everyone uh, would not leave their sleeping quarters without putting on their uh, ballistic vest. As I wouldn't do that, but they, they would, I mean, I, they always kind of stuck with me, but um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It was a, it was a trip for, for 30 days. You're just like trying to, trying to kill these dudes, these snipers in the hills and stuff like that. Eventually, we just left. I don't know if we got them or not. We just packed them. Well, I mean, it, unless you just carpet bomb that whole area, there's really nothing you can do. I mean, th those guys have the advantage of, you know, just taking a shot and then moving and taking a shot. Yeah. You'd never find out where they yeah. were. Yeah, and they they could yeah they could see shadows through the tarps and they knew where you were. You didn't move. Um, right. So we did actually carpet bomb the place when we left. Nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had uh, we got a B one and. I think we dropped like 
10 bombs, seven or 10 bombs all through the mountainside and just took off after that. Nice. So, yeah, it was cool. So that, and this was all your first deployment. This is yeah, all, my, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was my first, first deployment. And, and uh, I'll be quite honest, like I was kind of, um, did you have how many more conventional, do you have any more from this deployment that you want to talk about or? No, I, 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 I did almost get out though. It, it was a uh, Clint who, who let me control as a romad, let me control airstrikes as a romad. Like literally <laughs> you have those scenarios where, oh, my radio went down. You have to control. Yeah. yeah. And li shit literally happened. Like he was, his radio went down. So it was in those instances. And then Barge Matal, I got to drop, drop bombs as a romad. Nice. So that's what kind of kept me around in the career field, like motivated me to stay in. I, I was going to get out. I had, I'd been accepted to, Colorado State University, and I'd, I'd been accepted to another university in Charleston. I was going to go to ROTC, but um, decided to stay in because because of things I got to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I did I did two more conventional rotations. I did a, a little less than a six month in Farah Province, which was a I was I was there as a new JTAG. It was kind of a real big snooze fest. Um, not yeah. much going on in in the in the Western part of Afghanistan. So I did that for about five and a half months. And then the last conventional deployment I did was a nine month to Fob Joyce, which is, um, it's South of Asadabad. Okay. Um, so that was, and that was in the lead up. So that was 2012. That was kind of in the lead up to put in my package. I had a, I went in there with a plan to take the nine months to get in the best shape of my life. I think I was 24 at the time. Nice. And, and that's what I did, man. I, I, uh, we would pull top shift or there wasn't a lot of outside the wire missions, but if there were uh, me and my Roma and I would, would do them. I did two. Yeah. I did two air assaults, which were like really big missions. Yeah. I brought a, I brought a different Roma at each time. Um, but one of the pictures I sent you was the first air assault we did. Uh, we were providing sort of um, s uh, supporting. We were providing support to the Afghans who were doing like a vehicle clearance through this through this village. So at okay. night, yeah, we got we got dropped off, um, scattered throughout the hilltops surrounding the valley that they're going to drive through. And during the night, we we got dropped a pallet of sandbags and we built really tiny fighting positions. Yeah. Yeah, and as soon as uh, as soon as the daylight hit, the Afghans were getting lit up, and we were told, you know, wait until they ask for help. We wanted them to kind of fight through it and stuff like that, but it wasn't it wasn't, you know, an hour into it they're asking for help. So yeah, I mean, tens on station just doing gun runs and dropping bombs in the hilltops. Dudes are firing the uh, fifty cal on a tripod. I don't think we had mortars. <laughs> it was it was pretty badass, but. So just like Clint taught me, man, I had my, my Romad kind of double checking all my grids. Yeah. Uh, he was great. Justin Jackson was his name. Anyway, um, we, we would alternate between a tens coming on station. I had a B one at one point on station. I didn't drop with them. Uh, and then Apaches, they would kind of alternate. Um, and at one point towards the latter half of the day, we were there all day man. all yeah. day, just getting shot at. And that's when, um, that was the first, first time that really sticks out in my mind of being physically shot at. Um, okay. they, we were in just a small, uh, it was like maybe three sandbags high as best we could do. Cause everyone had to share the sandbag. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> so you hear the, uh, the buzzing. That was, that was the first time really that, cause I didn't get shot at very much. My first or definitely not my second deployment. Um, so that was kind of perched you up a little bit. Oh man, they're shooting. Yeah, at I bet. Me. Uh, yeah. Like, oh. So like they know where you are, and you know. Yeah, you're not yeah. going anywhere either. It's not like you can kind of move and advance Maneuver. the enemy. You're on a hilltop. Yeah. Uh, sitting there. So. Uh, yep. So, air aircraft, um, a tens check off, Apaches check off to go get fuel, and they go as a two ship. So as soon as the Apaches, as soon as you can't hear them anymore, um, un, unbeknownst to us, the enemy, it's, it's hard to, hard to articulate over, over this forum, but 
the enemy had been moving throughout the day up the hillside to flank my position. Oh, the, okay. army, the army had started to retrograde back because we were prepping for prepping for exfil in the evening. Yeah. So there was a large group of dudes all around me um, kind of prepping for exfil. But the enemy had been moving throughout the day, unbeknownst to any of the aircraft or the UAVs that we had. And they, uh, they had set up like an ambush position, probably like less than a kilometer. I, don't, I couldn't tell you how, because I never saw them. But yeah. all of a sudden, man, I just hear the, the crack, not the buzzing, but the gah, 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 gah. And, uh, man. But <laughs> I couldn't, um, there, was, there was too many people in front of me to like, like return fire, because there's just tons of Joes everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so I was just trying to make myself small. Um, right. which is which is never never what you want to say but I, i'm not going to start firing into the crowd of these army dudes yeah yeah not, i mean for sure man i'm not going to get not going to hit but i hear you see guys just running with the with the 50 cal skid it up on tripod and just laying waste and uh and i'm i'm not screaming but I, i'm over the fires i'm like troops in contact or troops in contact anyone with troops in contact, and they and they hear me at the refueling point i don't know how they did it but yeah. then they come back around and A-10s were, were on their way. So we just start hammering the, the hillside. But that was um, that was the first time I'd been ambushed. And and here, here in the crack, when, when, well, that's when you know it's pretty close. So Yeah. So did you end up uh, taking the, the threat out with the Apaches? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And I think about this a lot. Um, what I was taught at the 17th um, and kind of, passing that knowledge along i i did things sequentially i the a10s would come in and i'd have the apaches hold off somewhere safe and they would drop mm -hmm. bombs or they'd do a gun run and then i would switch and i would have the apaches but you know as you know you, you don't have to do that you like you can right. you can integrate put some parameters in there and, and do some combined attacks yep um coordinating attacks excuse me so um, i just didn't have the knowledge at that point to do that so sure. i was trying to be really safe but yeah i, I think um which is, there is no hit on you. You, you have to control to your, uh, skill level, you know, that's, and you, that's what you did and you were effective and it, it worked out. Um, you know, as you learn later on, you can, there are different things you can do, which is, I think now, I think that's kind of what it used to be. I think now everybody is kind of getting that knowledge, you know, like you said, like it, we're starting to proliferate that between amongst the career field and we're all kind of, and, and to be honest, there's a lot of guys out there, a lot of conventional dudes that I've run across that do know how to do that have been doing it a long time and just can, they're just like the cast experts, yeah. you know, it's a, I, I, I'm not, I didn't, I didn't mean to imply that like the soft community has the, you know, uh, is ones the that can do that on, is the authority Yeah. They're not on, the authority on, on coordinated attacks or, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. I mean, they've conventional guys have been doing joint air attack teams since, you know, the eighties. So, um, but anyway, to your point, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's just a lack of knowledge sometimes when you, when it, you're out there yeah it was and you know what it, it, it's it's free to read about in the in the j fire right <laughs> right it, right been exactly yeah you never, maybe you never because we never uh we didn't work with helicopters that often yeah i don't know but yeah that'll always stick with me is like you kind of replay stuff in your head at random points you know For in sure. your life you're like yeah, yeah. i could have done better at that so um anyway yeah we we, we stopped the threat nobody nobody is shot um nice they were, and they were chucking chucking grenades down the hillside. I don't know how close they were, but close enough for to throw grenades. Wow. Um, um, and then the radio back to the battalion commanders, like, hey, we, we got to exfil these guys. They're just hanging out on this hilltop. And somehow they got approval for like a daylight exfil. Um, so we, yeah, the 60s land and exfil everyone. I was pretty excited. I, I didn't want to hang out there anymore. <laughs> but I'll bet. Yeah. yeah, just kind of. Yeah, the, the Afghans had left like hours ago. Oh, really? Yeah, they were like, "Fuck this, we're we're out of here," and they turned around <laughs> and we're just like, just sitting out on there the flapping, hilltop. man. Yeah. So, um, I, I was I was the only one in my in the group of six who who was fortunate enough to be able to do that one, and another um, air assault. It kind of in the same general area. Um. But yeah, once again, you know, the, the Taliban, whoever they were, would, would they would sneak up on your position all day and get within hand grenade range. Um, on, on the second air assault, uh, you know, I saw for the first time Kiowa pilots leaning outside of their um, helicopter and shooting with their M4 into the wood line and shit like that. So, nice. Yeah, that was 
uh, that's pretty cool. Um, what else? Oh, man, so not to not to downplay this at all, but August eighth, two thousand twelve, um, Major Gray was killed, and he was yeah. he was actually flying out and coming to see us. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, he was coming out. Um, that was a crazy phone call. We knew he was coming, and he was with you know a lot of top brass, the sergeant major of that brigade. He was incoming, brand new. He had just gotten in country and was doing like a battlefield tour. And and they first stopped in a Sadabad and the fob there. And they did it every day, you know, at the same time every day. They would land there and they would walk in the open. We were were waiting on him to come and you heard the news that they had been ambushed with uh, two people. A couple guys got uh, medals medals of honor uh, out of it. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, the, the SAS were doing a mission out of our, they were using our FOB as a staging point and they had their command team and with them, uh, or I don't know, oh, they had a PJ team. So the PJ mm-hmm. team got launched in response to that, in, in response to that. So they, and oh, when okay. they came, yeah, when they came back, so I still hadn't heard any news when they came back from that and they were kind of recouping. One of the guys saw me staring at him because I knew he was there rescuing people. I was like, hey, did you see, you know, did you see an Air Force guy? He's like, well, everyone I touch, man, they're still alive and kicking. So I was like, all right, cool. So we mm, still hadn't heard yeah. anything at that point. And then our yeah. um, our flight chief got us up on, he, you know, called us on the phone at the desk and said, hey, get everyone together. And we went in the conference room and uh, and they told everyone that we, we lost a lost a good tech P today. So it was fucking surreal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that sucked. Yeah. I, you know, immediately thought about his kids. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And he was a, he was a good one. I don't know if you knew much about him, but I didn't know, I didn't know him at all. Um, <laughs> but from the guy, guys that I knew that knew him spoke very highly of him. Like he was like just a great guy. I mean, yeah, just awesome guy. Just a nice dude, you know, goes to bat for guys. Just a, yeah. a straight up, you know, a, a great leader. Yeah, he, he was. Yeah. It was, that's where we're super disappointed about was, he he was a guy who could have made big changes because he thought of he was for the for the boys as they say yeah yeah um, in a good way so uh, yeah it was it was a huge loss um, and it it messed up a lot of people in different ways um, mm-hmm. the flight chief I won't I won't say his name but he really he uh, in my opinion he shut down you know we still had a still had the rest of the deployment to go we needed some leadership and he kind of shut down and the assistant flight commander. He went by, uh, he's still active duty. He went by Peaches. He stepped up in a big way. I think he was an ABMer. Man, he stepped up in a huge way. Made sure like he uh, brought the people together. Um, and uh, we were just over, out, just impressed. Unendingly impressed about his ability to step into that position, that huge hole and, and you know, bring what he bring what he could just for the guys. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's a tough time. I mean, you never know how people are going to react to, you know, the guy that kind of broke down and kind of withdrew. I mean, they probably had a good relationship. You know, they probably had, they were probably tight. And he, I mean, losing a buddy, I mean, we've all lost buddies, you know, and it's just, it hits people differently. And, and yeah, there's nothing really you can do about it. I mean, there's, you can't fault the guy for the way he acted. I mean, it's just, that's, you never know how you're going to feel when you hear that news, you know, so. I but good was, for that other guy too that stepped up. I mean, that yeah. was you know, it's it's good to have you know a guy that can fill those fill that that void. You, you never you never imagine that you'd be in that situation, but yeah, he he rose to the occasion in, in a big way. Yes, yeah, I, I think it, um, I think initially it's easy to judge someone, but you're right. Yeah, the flight chief he was it was flight chief flight commander, you know, working as a team together, spending time yeah. together. He knew so yeah, and we were too quick to judge. I think. Yeah. Well, so. I mean, here's the thing about it is you have to, I don't think it's, um, in your guys' defense, I mean, you are in a combat zone and you're like, I got it. We need, we're having a hard time, but we need to focus on the mission, you know? And, um, so it's, I could see both sides, you know I mean? I could, yeah. I can understand how both, both of you, you know, both sides would react in the way they did, but yeah, it's tough, man. I mean, that's war. Like, like I, I, I just, it's so easy to say, but it's really is true that that's just the way war is. I mean, you just, it affects people differently and there's different things that go on and you just, it's uncertain and you know, you just kind of have to have to keep moving, uh, you know, 
So you don't you don't have a choice. Yeah. You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah Somebody you, you have to do something. I mean, you can't all just break down or you can't all withdraw. So yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I think those are like the those are the things that really stick out to me um, during that deployment. We they they minimized. I think I did a couple. Oh, that was the deployment before, but yeah, yeah, those are the big ones for 2012. Nine months is a long time. Uh, yeah, not like not like John. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, like 15, 15 month deployments. I think he stayed even longer or something like that. But nine um, months is a long time, I and mean, that's like that's. I mean, especially if you have kids and a family, and you know what? Yeah, you're taught your intermittent, you know, uh, emails back and forth, or maybe some, you know, a sat phone call doesn't fill that that void that you left, you know, that that's too long. I think, I mean, I don't understand why we put guys through that. I mean, I know nine is not quite what the army guys are doing. They were doing, like you said, like John was doing 12 and 15 monthers, but yeah, that's just seems crazy to me. It just, it seems too long. I, and number two, I, I'm a firm believer that their battle fatigue sets in, you know, like you, like you can only go, go, go for so long before, you start getting complacent or you start getting, you know, careless or whatever it is. I mean, I, I just feel like not that anybody was. And I think that's a testament to like the army guys that were there and you guys that were there is that, yeah, you, there, there is a tendency to do that, but they still stepped up and they still completed the mission. I mean, it's just the American fighting person. I don't want to say fighting man. Cause there's fighting women too, but the American fighting person is, is just some, a force to be reckoned with, you know, for yeah. that reason. So, the, the but I think, it's on, I think it's on the leadership yeah. to like recognize that they are go, go, go all the time and to say, OK, let's give these guys a break. Let's make it six months or, you know, it's it's definitely I don't know. Like you said, you got to keep going. You have to do it. But yeah, I think the leadership would do a little something different to make them so they don't have to do it. You know, I, I can kind of see the perspective, though. It's like, you know, it, it says something to like know your area, know the lay of the land, understand the local populace like. And as you sure. constantly rotate people out, like you, you kind of lose that. So, to the to the detriment of the, the people that are that are there, that you know, I see. I can see yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, and and you. But at what cost, though? That's yeah. kind of my point. You know, like it's like yeah, you you're an expert in that in that area because you've been there a year. Yeah. But then it's like, what about this guy's personal life, or what about you know? All right, Fuck I know. it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We're here. To, if they we're... wanted you to have a family, Matt, they would have issued you one. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Uh, so anyway, yeah. okay. So that was your, that was your last deployment, uh, as a okay. conventional guy. Yeah. And then tell me about that. So tell okay. me that transition from had to get the out. conventional world to soft. Okay. Uh, where to begin the hardest, <laughs> I'm going to tell you the, the hardest part. And I learned this phrase yesterday, uh, self. Now I'm going to fuck it up. I'll, I'll, I'll think of it. Uh, a little bit anyway my my biggest hurdle to um transitioning or trying out for soft was the written package i drug my feet i sat on it forever and then this was kind of revealed in the uh, personality test with the psych docs as well like i just had a lot of self-doubt self-limiting um behaviors i had self-limiting behaviors that was it. okay um so the hardest thing and, and it was peyton or it was my wife who it's like, Hey, finish it, turn it in. You know, yeah. I was already self-selecting and it, it was her pushing me to do that. Got it in. And then I got accepted. That was the first phase. Right. And then the second phase was actually going down to Herbert field and, and doing the tryout. Um, and I went down there with a buddy of mine, Scott Andrews, we were both from, both from Fort Carson. The dude was a physical specimen. Um, mm -hmm. his life was working out in CrossFit, like, he didn't care about anything else. Um, yeah. So, and that's where I met you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That's Please. Yeah. You. Let's uh, let's hear about it. <laughs> I don't know. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was a, I think it was a very well-run uh, selection and assessment program. You, you do the intelligence test. Uh, you do your psych, psyche eval. You, we stand up in there in blues. Um, and whatever answer we gave you, it was the wrong one, no matter <laughs> how you spun it. Uh, <laughs> the one thing that really stands out, uh, I kind of made an ass out of myself. We were doing some sort of, uh, physical iteration with the hu pushing Humvees and something like that. And we'd finished up mm. and man, I can't remember that guy's name, 
but he was he was a special tactics tac p versus some of the other folks the majority of the folks that were uh ranger ranger tac p worked with the okay regiment. you know what i'm talking about but he he had said he had said to her, and i was feeling really good like i had physically prepared for nine months before this so like um i'm not tooting my own horn here but like physically no. it, it didn't it didn't set me back like i was never i never to the point where i was like exhausted or didn't have my mental faculties about me yeah, yeah. but he's like yeah nobody tried out for or nobody said that they want to do st tech p and i said well no one really wants to work for the b team and uh and i didn't know he was <laughs> yeah. an st tech p and uh, he looked at me sideways and i was like oh shit uh, you was, said this during the, the assessment yeah, yeah. Uh, i was <laughs> an idiot man <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not uh not smart not optimal yeah evan came up to me the next day uh and he's like hey man you're doing good you just need to like be a little bit more humble buddy i was like oh, okay yeah buddy. got it uh oh gabby gabby lick was there gab oh, okay yeah he was a uh, what a character oh, uh he's the best i'm sure people tell tons of stories about him my i only had two interactions with him and he was he was a cadre at my selection assessment and uh I just remember, I don't know what it was for the extended, extended day of training or, or smoke session. Uh, he had put on a hat and it was yelling and acting crazy in the dorm room, trying to get everyone up and out there like super early, <laughs> like two o'clock in the morning or something like that. But yeah, he was always intimidating. You guys all, were all very intimidating, right? Um, I'll never forget. So we did the 12 mile ruck. We knew it was 12 miles. You guys didn't take, take our watches away, but I didn't use it anyway yeah. but at the start jt at the start of the ruck said this is an individual event you will thomas not... not taylor yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. jt was the j uh, tom i think he was a retired chief i want to say but he was the he was in charge of the whole incessant selection like he was the guy he was the he ran the whole thing just to so to clarify so people yeah, think for, was, for folk, yeah. yeah thanks uh, he's a good dude great 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 guy awesome dude I, I came back as a cadre a, a few years later and I got to chat with him on a, on a different level, you know, yeah. it, was, it was nice. Super laid back. Just great dude. Yeah. Well, he, he said, this is an individual event. Uh, you will not go back for your teammates. Um, oh, yeah. and I was like, okay, well, uh, those are the instructions. So we take off and, and, um, yeah, uh, we finish. And a few guys who had finished took off the rucksack, hydrated and ate, and then started to go back for their teammates. And uh, and I didn't. And me, me and a couple other guys didn't because I was like, well, he told us not to. He told us not to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll get to that part later. But anyway, we uh, <laughs> somebody looked in our rucksacks. And the day before, and I'm really jumping all over the place, the day before, in the packing list that you guys gave us, which was it was probably just a generic packing list from all of the selections, but it had yeah. fins and a mask. Well, no, none of us had fins, but we you were, you were given masks. Mm -hmm. So the the class leader had asked the day before, hey, do we need to keep this in our ruck? And you guys had told him no. But then he came back to us as a team and said, hey, we better just keep it in there anyway, just because. And yeah. I think it was Evan who found it in there. And he said, <laughs> I told you guys, you didn't need this. All right. And he got pissed. All right, everyone, put your mask on. So we just ran 12 <laughs> miles with a ruck on. Everyone puts their mask, and then he fills up the mask with water. And then we walk over <laughs> to a puddle. We start doing low crawls through a puddle that was over our back. It was, yeah. it was cold. I think it was January or February. It was yeah. miserable, man. And then so, <laughs> tack peas are not known to for being comfortable around water or having water right, in their right. nose. And it was. Some guys are like, I can't breathe through my mouth. And they're just losing <laughs> their mind, man. Yeah. Uh, miserable, I'm miserable. sure. Miserable. And then you, and I kept putting my muzzle in the dirt. And you, for some reason, singled me out. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, I had muzzle in my, or had muzzle in, or dirt in my muzzle for one too many times. You made me do eight count bodybuilders with water in my mask. And so I, that, that was always, my impression but but uh yeah you didn't was, like you didn't enjoy that that was no, not fun for you i you know i didn't have my muzzle in the dirt ever again well so maybe that, that was my biggest thing and i to yeah and granted we were trying to get you to remember stuff like that but um that was one of my biggest things because that was always taught to me like i like my from the time i was a, a young airman 
like muzzle awareness was always the biggest thing, you know, like if you, cause if you have dirt in your muzzle, it's not going to fire and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. and then you kept doing it. So I was like, <laughs> I was like well, why wasn't you doing it? Yeah. And, and I know the impossibility of the whole thing. Like it was just, you know, having to be in that situation, that's the last thing you care about. Like that's, who cares about this muzzle? Like, I'm just, I know it's a rubber duck. I know it's not real. Yeah. This sucks. Get off my, I know you're probably like, just get the hell off my back. You know, yeah. Just leave me alone. Yeah. Uh, no, it was, uh, yeah. Looking back now, it's, it's really funny, but man, this guy, I'm sure it wasn't funny at the time. Yeah. No, <laughs> but so we, we get through all that. We go back, get our rocks and, and, th and then we go back to the, um, to the gym to, to get smoked some more, I assumed. But uh, you stood up in front of everyone. We all we were all on the turf field, getting ready, and you stood up in front of everyone. And you're like, "Who raise your hand if you didn't go back for your buddies?" I raised my hand, and you're like, "Fuck you!" I'm like, "God, oh, man, he's right. <laughs> Fuck me." I was like, "That just sort of the mind games uh, that I that I it's just stand out. Those are the things that really stand out." Yeah, I I, I get a lot of grief. <laughs> Like I, we've talked about this a lot. I'm not um, trying to give you grief so, or, or anything. No, else. for people that uh, you know, people might think that you're. We, you and I have talked about this a lot. And at the time, like I was always, I the mindset I had, just having been through similar situations, you know, that I was using all that as experience for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then also, uh, I was always the guy, like, I, I, and I've told you this several times. If if you can get, if you keep going, if you just as long as you don't quit. Like put whatever we put you through. I'm like, I always voted everybody up. Like as long as you didn't, like I was never, I never got to the end. It was like, yeah, he got, he did it all, but you know, forget that dude. I was like, man, they, they, they endured this whole process and they didn't quit and they did well. Yeah, let's go. And then, so I, I always felt bad for guys that didn't make it after that. They completed the whole assessment selection, but there was some little thing that, that the rest of the cadre didn't like and they would yeah. like, vote them out. But. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it was, it's, uh, it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. So you, I crushed, man. I mean, that you obviously made it and, you know, it yeah. didn't, you didn't let, you didn't let it bother you. So that's good. Yeah. I didn't let you saying F you to me, <laughs> throw me off. Uh, <laughs> no, it was, it was, I think it was good for what it was. The JT was running so many selections and he had a formula that worked, but, you know, just like everything, it continues to evolve. And yeah. um, I don't, I don't have any, I don't think I knew, I must not have known that JT said that to you or something. Or did you think, did I know that? Did I know he said, don't go back I, I and pick those guys up? You, could, you couldn't have known. You couldn't yeah. have known. Yeah. I, I don't think I would have done that if I'd have known. Because no, I, no. I definitely wouldn't have wanted to go against JT. I mean, I would have been like, whatever, because he was the man, you know, like yeah. whatever he said, go. So I would have definitely fallen in line with what he said. So yeah, there's I, just some miscommunication. Someone else, uh, it must have been Evan, but he, he kind of revealed some of the conversations that you guys were having as cadre um, behind the scenes and maybe you talked about it, but uh, you, they said that you were personally frustrated that uh, people, he, you thought people were sandbagging on the rock. Yeah. You're like, man, when we did it, we would dump oh, out our yeah. two court, go for broke, dump out all of our water. And uh, yeah. And try and if you weren't first, you were last, or something like you know something to that effect. It was a technique. I mean, uh, yeah, I I got brought up from guys like Kenny Lindsay and uh, you know dudes and even Q. I mean, th th these guys when we did road marches, it was like you ran the whole time, and it, yeah. your water actually, if it's a twelve miler, that was a sprint for us. I mean, that was like you you dumped your water out because it was just going to weigh you down. You know, you tried to you tried to be as light as possible, and. Um, you know, it's just, it's just different ways people are brought up. You know, I, I, you guys were conserving your energy probably for whatever was next. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas we were just like, just, cr you know, you just try to crush everything. Oh, so yeah, yeah. it's a different yeah. mentality, different, different way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say like, um, having been on both sides of it, <clears throat> you guys have like a big responsibility, um, cause you're changing people's career path and, and lives. Yeah. So, um, I didn't recognize that until I was sitting in your guys' shoes a couple of years later. But, um, yeah, I got the, I got the good news at the end of the, the selection. Um, man, man, I was, you'll, you'll never forget that feeling. And, yeah. and Scott got picked up as well. It's like, it could have been super awkward because we had both flown there together. Like if one had gotten uh -huh. picked up and one, but, but you didn't have to worry about it. So, yeah. 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 And then I, uh, I was getting married officially, like 
a few months down the road. So it was all good. I, I was nice, nice. I was on top of the world. Um, yeah. So uh, got accepted. I got married. I went on a month long honeymoon, and then I started. You guys put me right into training. I got to go to jump school, and then did a long did the did the three month TDY to. Uh, STTS, which was new. Uh, we were certainly yeah. weren't the first uh, group to go through, but we were one of the newer ones yeah. where, you know, they, they paired mostly it was people from my assessment and selection, but there's a few stragglers who couldn't get in the classes beforehand. But yeah, STTS special tactics training school where um, combat controllers and, and some PJs get, get the advanced skills they needed to, to right. integrate into their um, special tactics squadron. So I think combat weather went through at the time and then yep. now there's yeah, sorry. special reconnaissance. So yeah, you're right. South team. And everybody was kind of different. Everybody had, cause I know LE worked down there for a long time. And so, and now that was when I was at AFSOC. So it kind of went over there quite a bit and saw how that mm-hmm. worked. And it was, um, yeah, I loved it, man. I thought that was a, such a great idea that, you know, have a, a central location for that kind of stuff. Cause yeah. before it wasn't like that. It was like whichever unit you were with kind of dictated how you were going to train so yeah. now it's more standardized so. you, you get different different uh different opinions um because it was it was focused on the st it had an st flavor to it right and a lot of the stuff yeah. that I, a lot of stuff that i did i'm not i'm not complaining about it whatsoever but a lot of the stuff i did i just really didn't use much in my career field yeah, that's um, a good point not not to say that i did it wasn't a good experience but um they, they were trying to make make do with what they had so like you had different classes of controllers and south and pjs going through at different times and mm-hmm. here we were just i think we were six guys or seven guys they're like okay you're gonna plug in with this team this week because oh doing yeah weapons and then you're gonna plug in with this team they're doing helo casting and um uh, w- we knew we were second class citizens yeah yeah i, I, I know what you I mean told yeah. You. yeah so so we always kind of had a chip on our shoulder with that, but we went into that course uh, where people come out as a five level already being a five level. We'd already, most of us had already deployed. Right. So we just had the real world experience that a lot of those guys didn't have. So maybe that made us feel. And better. I think a lot of it, and to your point about the special tactics training, a lot of those TTPs aren't the same as Ranger. Like no. there's a lot of Ranger thing, like Ranger TTPs that are, that don't cross that don't translate, you know? So yeah, I could see how it might've been a, maybe a little bit of negative training. Um, uh, yeah. So I could see how, you know, just different, different tasks could be performed different, different ways. Well, you guys weren't allowed or the curriculum did not allow to cover JTAC stuff. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 We tried like hell to get that in there. Yeah. So like, that was like, I'm sure that was year after year. One of the biggest, um, AARs, uh, mm-hmm. after action review stuff, like, Hey, we're, we got selected to be JTAX for these organizations. Like we should probably learn how they do business, which is, which is different. Yeah. Yeah. Very different. So. And um, they had a really great, uh, good simulator down there too. Like I, simulator. um, I was, I think I know Kevin was a big proponent of it. I was trying to help him out and we were trying to get people to just at least have that be a portion of a block of instruction. I, I, it might've been later on. But yeah, I don't think it was when you went through. But yeah, I mean, just getting in there and just getting giving the guy five assets and saying, yeah. "All right, let's you know get after it," would really because I mean, there was a lot of guys that never got that exposure until it was a real world situation, and it's yeah. like now you have, you know, manned ISR, unmanned ISR. You got A10s, you got an AC130, you got helicopters. It's like, all right, now deconflict all these assets and you know try not to kill anybody that you're not supposed to you know and it's like don't kill them and like yeah, yeah. you know deconflicting fires and it's it, not having that experience before going into that combat situation is a disservice for sure yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and it showed on some people that they struggled once, yeah. once they got out and got to the teams and actually had to do do some training and do that and uh yeah yeah people some people struggled it's daunting for sure yeah i, I struggled it was like the first time you know everyone does but it was the uh, one of the one of my he was a JTAC I for the detachment. He's like, hey, if you don't fix what you're doing, we're gonna get rid of you. Uh, this one was like, oh man, right. that's pretty drastic, dude. Really? Is like yeah, my first yeah. okay? <laughs> um, but it, it all worked out. I had we had a we had a retreat. Um, that sounds really bougie. We got we got together as a team for a retreat, and uh, he got a little too drunk, and he 
he was always very robotic and stiff, but he, he admitted to me, I don't know why he admitted to me, but uh, he's like, Hey man, I, you know, I was really, really hard on you guys because I felt unprepared when I deployed with the 17th to a degree. Yeah. And he was with uh, the Rangers that recovered the bodies at extortion one seven. So he was speaking from that experience. Uh, and he's like, I just had a really hard time adjusting and I didn't want you guys to go through that same thing. So I was like, sometimes yeah. we, sometimes that, that gets lost. You know, the reason behind what we do. Yeah. I, I've heard of that story a lot. Like a lot of guys that go to combat and they're like, man, I was not prepared for that. I need yep. to step it up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I think, which I think it now, I think our guys, our career field, I don't know when it started, but I think even the career field itself, plus the 17th, I think that has gone away. I think people are like, that they're getting the training they need right off the bat. And it's, I think it's a heck of a lot better than even when yeah. you were there, definitely when I was in for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, people are just going off. Well, one, you're working with Ranger um, and their mannerisms and behaviors and the environment that they work in rub off on you to almost yeah. to an annoying uh, point. <laughs> you know, you just, they're very you know, tough, very uh, direct, very, you know, no nonsense for sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's exactly the way Ranger is. It's like if you like they they RFS you, you know, you don't, you don't get a whole lot of chances in the in the regiment. You know, if you mess up once, maybe twice, you're out. So yeah, yeah. Yep. And people took that mindset. I, I I say it's like very. Um, if you wanted to classify it as a, a leadership type, it was like very transactional. Like, um, here's what I want you to do. Here are the benefits if you do it, and here are the repercussions if you don't. There's no yeah. like, hey man, let me. Um, and, and, they just didn't have the time for it. More sure. like the opposite of that is transformational. Like, I want you to to excel because you want to. I want you. <laughs> right. And most guys are self motivated, but you just didn't have time for that. Like, yeah. I need you to assault this bunker now. So, yep. like, I need fun. you to perform. If you're not going to do that, you're out. I need get. I'll get somebody else in there that's going to do that. Yep. For sure. I don't have time for you to find yourself and, you know, get motivated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which most guys were. Most guys were. Everyone. And that was yeah, a nice sure. thing. And I'm sure tons of guys tell you this, but guys wanted to be there. Yeah. They wanted to be there. So that, that put everyone at a, a really high level anyway. So guys wanted to be there, but guys didn't want to get treated like shit either. For sure. So, For sure. Um, mm -hmm. um, okay. So uh, I checked out all good. I, they thought I did okay to deploy. So I deployed with, um, I deployed in 2014 with, uh, Deco Delta Company, I think it was Third Platoon. Uh, deployed to Logar Province. This is two seven five. Two seven five, yeah, yep, two seven five. When uh, you know Delta Company was a line company, or uh, yeah, not a not a specialty troops, uh, special troops company. I right, what they call it. yeah, you know, what I'm yeah, saying. yeah, like yeah. Deco uh, Third Third Platoon. We go to Logar Province. I uh, can't remember for the life of me. I can't remember the name of the the base there. But this is my first first soft TACP deployment. Super excited. I was an idiot. Two days before we were going to leave, I played indoor soccer and like tore my groin horrendously. Oh. But I didn't tell anybody. Uh, yeah. Like an idiot. Um, well, yeah, I wanted to go. Like nothing was going to stop me. Short of for like, sure. Losing, short of like losing my leg. So. Uh, go on that deployment. Um, Ian, he's still uh, he's still in the Rangers, but he was my FSNCO. His name, first name is Ian. Um, taught me. I knew how to JTAC, but I, I didn't necessarily know. I had done um, one training evolution with that battalion prior to leaving, um, but uh, the rest of how to be how to work with the Ranger, like Ian taught me, and he he's the reason why you know I consider myself pretty successful, and and it's really nice to see this guy as a um, company FS NCO or fire support NCO. Uh, and then now he's, he's very high in the organization. I, I think he's still with the Rangers, but he's at the regimental level. So it's kind of nice. that's the relationships you get to foster. But so he kind of took me under his wing, taught me everything he knew. Um, and the way that rotation work worked was for the first half of the three and a half months you were there, one platoon would be the primary, the other would be QRF. So his, his platoon went first, um, 
I think they did six missions. We were, we, there was a stand down for whatever reason during that time. I can't recall. Um, but nothing happened on, on his missions at all. Like pretty, pretty benign, uh, a bunch of dry holes or just nothing really happened for him, unfortunately. Um, and at that time they were, uh, trying again to put the Afghans in the lead. So you'd have 60 folks uh, on the ground, but only 16 would be American. And they kept trying to limit the amount of Americans that would go on target. Um, so they get through with their half of the rotation, like pretty quiet. So, and then we're up, um, next with third platoon and, uh, first mission out. Uh, it was a, it was an offset. I can't remember how far we walked, but it, it wasn't too bad. Land somewhere, um, walk in, set isolation and containment on a, on a house. First ever mission. And, uh, Apaches see, see like five dudes, you know, maneuvering through the village into the open with a crew serve weapon that they're concealing very poorly. And, yeah. Uh, just um, told my commander or, you know, you've been taught like, hey, set up the fire mission at my command first. Then you, you read your commander in if it's not like impending danger, like a, a squirter or something like that. So Sure. He's like, yeah, take care of it. I'm like, oh, shit. Really? <laughs> so, so, yeah, I gave him clearance and wax these dudes quick. And that was that, that was always big because, you know, the first half deployment with Ian, nothing happened with him the first time out. Just got to waylay five guys who thought they were getting one over. Your on first, a, uh, first, first uh, deployment, yeah, first, first mission. Deployment. Yeah, uh, wow. and I wanted to keep going. I was passing the nine line to the eight tens, and the commander was like, oh, "Hold on, they're dead, man." Like, oh man, <laughs> are you sure? I, yeah, I said we ain't done yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could hear the disappointment in the pilot's voice. He's like, "I think, oh, I'm I, sure, we're still moving." I'm like, "All right, hold, hold on." So, uh, yeah, and that kind of set the tone. Uh, the very next mission, yeah, we had people shooting at us at night. Um, dudes in a field, and uh, I remember the the mortar mortar guys because they rarely get to shoot, but they're carrying all these mortars everywhere. Yeah, he's like, "Hey, man, can I shoot?" I was like, "Well, I'm I'm not the guy to ask, but I'll tell right. the commander." I was like, "Hey, hey, we can integrate these mortars here with these guys in the field," and uh, had AC-130. This is the second mission. AC-130 um, doing an IR sparkle and the, the mortarmen, the 60 guys, uh, using that IR sparkle as sort of a, a stake for them to aim off of because it's all at night. Um, yeah, yeah. And they're shwacking these dudes with these mortars. I mean, they're, were they doing direct lay or were they, uh, they sh indirect? Uh, I mean, it was handheld. Were they handheld? Yeah, or? it was handheld, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Love it. It whipped, they had it on the backpack, whipped it out real quick and doing his thing with his thumb. I, I don't know. To this day, I don't know how they do it at night, but they were uh, deadly. So he was, are... he was like super pumped. It's the first time he got, to, yeah. or the the first time that de deployment, he got to shoot his mortars. So uh, nice. kind of helped him out. The guy was already kind of fixed, I know, because we were shooting at him with the AC-130, but he was happy Still. about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, he's happy about it. Um, yeah, so that was so uh, like two two opportunities to, to use cast on, you know, the, the two missions. I think I ended up doing six total missions with, which compared to like, uh, deployments in the past that I I've heard about, like, um, I don't know if guys spoke on team Merrill or team Darby missions. Um, those were before my time when they would do remain over day missions, uh, yeah. or, or mission, you know, Rangers doing missions in Iraq and stuff like that, where it's like multiple hits a night. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, so more, they kind of died down when you went over there. It wasn't quite the norm to, yeah. Yeah. I know like match light talks about doing like 110 missions in 90 days or something, yeah. something crazy like that. You yeah. know, like every missions. day you're going out and yeah, yeah. More missions than you had days deployed. Right. Right. Cause you just fall. And it wasn't just like a, a follow on. It was like a completely different mission. They would say, Hey, we got something else. And they would give, they'd send them the con op over the whatever. And yeah. 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 yeah so, uh, there was, man, I can't remember what it was. It was always like politically charged. There was a big stand down through the big portion of our deployment, which to the disappointment of the, you know, the company commander and the platoon leaders oh, who, yeah. who, who rarely, like this is their one opportunity. And then they, they're continuing from the officer side, like they're continuing on in there. And this is like maybe their only shot 
as right. a platoon leader to lead men into combat in that regard. So, um, anyway, yeah, not yeah, because once they get back, they'll probably they'll make captain and they'll yeah. go do something else or they have to move on from that position. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so that, that, was my, that was my first you, deployment with, with range yeah. in Logar province. And that was the first time I had seen dudes train to uh, go to CAG selection. I don't know what you're calling it, what everyone else is calling oh, okay. it. Yeah. Army yeah. dudes. Um, and the, uh, the level of dedication and, workouts that they would do was, was something that i had ne- couldn't even conceptualize um, yeah so that always left a really big there was a squad leader who's in there now uh, i believe but he's he's a pretty big dude but um he would run around base with his um vest on with his weapon he would just run but he had his rucksack on as well just like and yeah. the the base was there's no paved roads it was all just rocks the size of baseballs and he'd be running yeah, yeah. laps on baseball size and i was like god damn man this guy's a killer so uh now the, i'll never I, forget that <laughs> to, that's a good point to the and i don't i don't be like lame or whatever weird or whatever but that that was ranger dude that was like some of the just the hardest toughest badasses i've ever you can't even people that are listening who have never experienced that you you think you can imagine what, when I'm trying to explain it to you, but you can't, like, I can't even express it in words like how these guys will go, just take it to another level. Yeah. It's like their mentality. I and mean, that's what I think it was. I mean, cause you hear about these old eighties Rangers that were like, they'd run like, you know, a 10 miler and then, you know, get done and just start smoking cigarettes or whatever, you know, they're just, it's just the mental, the mental capacity these guys have just to do, just to keep going yeah. is amazing. It's amazing. It's, it's yeah. I think they, the guys had it figured out. Like, they their jobs was direct action were direct action missions short in duration right right? um so i have to be able to move fast under under kit but not for very long right initially this this is all going to change as as stuff evolves as it always does or maybe reverts back to way it, it was when you when you guys would do those long um overland movements but they're yeah. like, I'm going to get as strong as possible because maybe I got to manhandle dudes and I got to be carrying all this heavy shit. And, um, yeah, so they were, um, they were working out. They had, they had a good idea of what they needed to work out. And it's just always really impressed. Like, well, I'll talk to the LT about it because he yeah. was young. And I was like, man, you just cannot imagine the physical prowess of some of these dudes where a guy who doesn't, um, doesn't clean any weight he just does other exercises looks at a bar with 300 pounds and is like i'm going to clean that right now and he, <laughs> right, he, yeah. he goes over and does it he's just like <laughs> yeah yeah it, it'll it's amazing it'll change the way you think um and and also in in, in to, uh, like that and kind of like you were talking about how some of that ranger stuff rubs off on us that motivated all of us we were like mm-hmm. Like I told you before, like I, how much I used to, uh, you know, get in the gym and clean. Like with, it was it was strictly because of these guys I used to work with. They were doing these crazy things. I'm like, well, God, I need to do that stuff, you know. So then you just get in there and you just start getting after it, you know. Yeah. And it's uh, it's really motivating yeah. for sure. It's like, oh, that's the level I have to be. I thought I was at a high level, but now I need to. Just, man, I'm not anywhere where yeah, I need yeah. to be. Yeah. Yeah. Guys running, you know, uh, what was it? some incredible 12 mile rup times they're running the entire time you know yeah. under 30 minutes or something well, like that to your, to your point i mean that's kind of where like when i was talking to you at yeah. the selection like that's where that came from like that you know just being in that kind of shape or that kind of having that mentality that's that's where it all stemmed from yeah. you know like yeah they're running they're running like six seven minute miles with 50 pounds on their back and right. yeah i was like ah, it's damn. crazy uh yeah yeah it makes it it makes everyone want to be oh man there was a really good saying this businessman had he's like i only hire belgian horses like the plow horses i only talking about people but belgian plow horses will will pull individually eighteen thousand pounds or something like that but when you put two of them together um, they're not going to pull just double of one they're going to continue to compete against each other and they'll pull yeah yeah Five that's a good analogy months. and and that's what it was man these guys are like yeah belgium plow horses monstrous but that they feed off each other yeah i thought it was really oh cool. yeah they could do they could do tons more when their buddies were around yep. than they could ever do alone yep. for sure yeah <laughs> just for the pure 
well, I'm not gonna let this guy beat me, or I gotta, I gotta impress this dude, or whatever. Well, it's not even in the gym either. It's you know, on, on everywhere. target, everywhere. Yeah, on shooting. Target. Yep. You know, everything, everything. Well, this guy's sucking, but yeah, I thought I was sucking, but this guy's got it much worse than me. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna nut up now and. <laughs> you get like a, a an extra burst of energy because yeah. you see your buddy over there sucking. Yeah, yeah you're like, yeah. oh yeah, cool. Yeah. And then he that then he probably sees you take off. And he's like, well, I can't let this guy beat right, me. Right. Exactly. He takes off after he's him. And yeah. Exactly. Me. Fuck that dude. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So that kind of wrapped up my first first deployment. It was it was great. Um, Ian again, man. He was he kind of set the standard for the um, fire support NCOs. Like if we weren't doing stuff, which most nights we weren't because of the because of a stand down, we were training. Yeah. We were training his um his guys, and I. I grew to have an appreciation for, for training those guys or making use of your time to, to continue to hone your craft. And I would, I would work with some of those guys in later deployments and it, it, it paid dividends. Nice. Um, so yeah, that was 2014. And then steadily uh, from 2014 to 2021, it's just gone. I was just going, I did um, the next one. Was I heard Maddie Green talk about it? I'm sure a couple other guys talked about it, but doing the OGA rotations, which was yep. where you wanted to be, and uh, before I before, that was a good gig. Yeah. Oh man, that was the best. It literally was, was everything you liked about the deployment and nothing you hated. None of the bad stuff. Like right. Yeah. No oversight. Uh, you wear what you wanted to wear. There was, <laughs> you know, relaxed grooming standards for us, which was great. Um, you're treated like an adult. It was, yeah, every, literally everything good. If you wanted to, uh, you could, every day that you weren't on a mission, you could go to the range and you can shoot and there's endless amounts of ammo yep. and demo. demo. Yeah. We used to blow demo all the time. Yep. Just, oh man. Just, yeah. Anything you wanted to demo. Do, ammo. Yeah. Um, the thing I liked the most about that particular mission was that not only did you have very little oversight, you could kind of do what you wanted to do, but those guys wanted you there because those OGA guys didn't have any assets. So they're like, man, I'm stuck here with all these Afghani dudes. And like, I don't have really any protection, but if I bring number one, a, a U.S. team in, yeah. but also a JTAC, holy shit. I mean, I got like, now I have everything at my disposal. You know, yeah. we brought, because you know how much asset, how many assets we brought to bear anytime we went out. I mean, it was like, so yeah, they they was they were really receptive to, to yeah. us coming working with those guys. Yeah, they um, yeah exactly. They 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 I wouldn't say invincible was what they felt, but they could handle anything that came up. Even the, the it they, was it was always uneven in our favor, but we just helped make sure that that it stayed that way. Um, sure, exactly. Which is what that's what it's supposed to be. I mean, you you're not. I never wanted, I never ever wanted to go in a fight where it was like no. evenly matched. No. You know, I wanted to have the, I wanted to have the edge. I wanted to have the, you know, I, that's not what war is. I mean, war is having an overwhelming advantage over the enemy and letting all your guys come home and hopefully little to none of them yeah. survive. So, yeah. yeah, I, I didn't want that deployment to end, uh, that first, yeah. first OGA one. I didn't want it to end. Uh, the, the, main difference in my personal life between that one and every other deployment was I'd had my son. My son was three months old, six months old, my first oh, one. Yeah. So it's like something, and maybe you had this too when you had your kids, but I was now no longer invincible. I yeah. had something to live for. I mean, I, I never wanted to get killed. I know exactly what you mean. Yep. Yeah. I had something to live for. So I didn't purposely put myself in dangerous situations for the, for the hell of it, um, which was really counterintuitive to what my team leader wanted to do. Um, and it was really, it was really wild. The team leader was the, the whole, um, group supporting OGA was enlisted. Everyone was enlisted. There wasn't an officer to be seen. Not to say that that made influenced, you know what I'm saying? It. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it, it's a double-edged sword because you you don't want to do anything to get yourself in harm's way, but also you're in that situation where you can do a lot of good. So it's like I, I know exactly what you're saying, and you and that's and I just talked about this with Billy Otter yesterday. Um, you, I always tell people that if you're going to do this job, wait 
on having a family. Yeah. I said, I, I, I think that's, and people say, well, that's, that's kind of myopic to say, or that may, that's not good for everybody. But I'm like, when you have a family at home, when you have kids, especially because another adult, your wife, you love her, but she can, she can kind of handle whatever's going on. But when your kids, when you're gone from your kids and you miss, and, you know, having a child is different and it's, where a lot of us can kind of compartmentalize that and not have it be a distraction as much as we think that is not a distraction it is a distraction yeah. i mean regardless of how how hard charging you are um one way or another it's, it's going to be some sort of a distraction so and i'm not saying that the only thing i'm saying is if you have the option wait for the family yeah. do the do the go in there and get in the fight you know do all that hard charging stuff and then maybe settle down and have a family because doing both is a, an extra challenge that you don't, you don't necessarily need, yeah. you know, I, I don't recommend it, but I know we all did it. There's tons of us that have done oh, yeah. it and we, you know, it's, it's in it in certain ways, but it, it's hard um, not to, when you have a, a longer career than, you know, just a few years. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I never, at least I wouldn't let it affect the decisions I had to made on target, but it was, there was always intrusive thoughts like, yeah. Uh, is another man going to raise my kid? Cause I'm dead. That shit would fuck, <laughs> right. fuck with me, man. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, the, the team leader that I had was a sniper. He was like, a, uh, he was a sniper team leader, um, uh, back in the rear. Um, mm -hmm. phenomenal. He's just a killer, man. He was awesome. Like he was good at, at being a ranger. Yeah. 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 He, he, so, on the plus side, man, that, that was really awesome to see people, um, at the top of their craft. He would carry a sniper rifle with him everywhere he went. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so it maybe a little, um, his focus wasn't where it needed to no. be. Maybe no, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. We, we told him all the time. I was like, Hey man, I, I need you to like coordinate with hire and then authorize me to do this strike and i can i can end this now but instead you're over here on this side of the cliff dumping mags into these dudes running like an, <laughs> I, I i need you to play the role that you were selected to do and not the role that you want to do yeah, yeah. So, right um, i've got i've got two stories about him that i, I wanted to tell that kind of highlighted how how good he was um kind of to the detriment of the, the rest of the team but uh we were we did a we did a gaff or a ground ground assault force uh, on on probably those same Hiluxes that Matty Green talked about. Um, <laughs> I heard him describing it. I was like, "Yeah, we got that one." There's no no suspicion yeah. left in it. But uh, <laughs> you drive for six hours through the night, uh, do a clearance through the night, then switch over and do a clearance through the day, and then we start the Xville. Um, we were going to wait till the night, but we we. There was nothing there, so we started exfilling during the day, and you you get all this traffic that they're they're gonna make the earth shake, and we're gonna get them on their exfil, and and man, yeah. to to the testament of the OGA guys, we like sat around in a circle, and they drew it out on the dirt. They're like, hey, all right, we're gonna take half our force, half our force, and we'll look like we're exfilling, and then as we come around this berm, the rest of our uh, convoy is gonna stop. And then we're all going to creep up online on the military crest and wait for them to get decisively engaged with the, the troops that are leaving. And then we're all going to crest vehicles and, and, and men are going to crest a hill and just lay waste to these dudes in this village. And that, sure enough, that's what happened. Uh, nice. Yeah, they started just, you know, how it goes, like really sh like just a few pop shots here and there. And then, then the, the yeah. enemy would like ramp up their fire and you knew yep, they were yep. committed. And then we had gun trucks with ZPU twos on them. And recoilless rifles, <laughs> the Afghans just laid waste to this village. It was awesome. But as so they, uh, the OGA guys and the Afghans got to the hilltop before us because we were further back in the convoy. And uh, as you should be as, in that situation, it, because it, yeah, I no matter how hard charging we were, I was always behind those local guys. I mean, yeah. I didn't ever want to be leading the way, you know, in front of yeah, those guys. So you, you were in the right place. Well, yeah. so. Uh, in anticipation of like getting his gun out, I'll just call him Jay. So Jay, he had his sniper rifle in a, an attack kit on the rooftop, got it out, handed it to the, the guy in the front seat. And he's like, Hey, as soon as I put this vehicle in park, I'm going to run around and grab my rifle. I'm going to be on top of that hill and slams it is a stick shift. So slams it into park 
sprints around the front of the vehicle. The it was a medic gave him his sniper rifle, and as and I'm kind of in, in trail behind him, as he's running up this little hilltop. Uh, one of the OGA guys, hey, I got a dude on a moto. And like he crests the hilltop and he asked the guy, how far? He's like 500 meters, lays down. And I see the, I see the guy in the, in the moto and just shot and dusted him. Like from running out of a vehicle, getting in the prone, shot a moving target at 500 meters. I saw the guy Jeez. keel over. I was like, oh my God, that was cool. So just like one instance of how, how good this guy was. Uh, yeah, yeah, impressive. Uh, uh, dropped a bomb on some guys on the hilltop, but um, we left after like the Afghans started like coming down the hill and like wanting to go into the village, which was never the plan. They started yeah, blowing yeah. holes uh, with their recoilless rocket into the buildings. And we're like, no, 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 no. We just <laughs> uh, it just got out of hand quick, and some of them started getting shot. And so, sorry, we got to go. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it was. <clears throat> It was gnarly. Um, I just, I'll always remember that him shooting a guy, shooting a moving guy on a motorcycle at 500 meters, like Jeez. Off, off the, off the get. So, but those guys, I mean, it, Ranger snipers, I mean, uh, my, the sniper crew that I worked with the third battalion was phenomenal. Like they were, the, they just went like every time they went to any kind of competition, they would just smoke everybody. Like it wasn't even a contest. It was, they were just like, they're just that, that highly trained, you know, they just practice all the time and they got the, the, the corporate knowledge is keeping passed down through the generations and man, these guys are, they're just, they're the best. I mean, they're, they really are some of the best snipers out there. Um, I think they get discounted yeah, a lot. So, oh, for sure. Cause they're, you know, they're that, I mean, to everyone else's detriment who does that, the Rangers are always kind of getting, you know, discounted by mm -hmm. maybe like a higher level, higher level units, but they always perform. They're always consistent. They're all, they always do their job. You know, yeah. I think about, can you even think about a time in history where it was the Rangers fault that something didn't happen? Like, yeah, you got like point du Hawk, but that they still, even though they got bad Intel and they, the weather was shit, they still kicked the hell out of those guys. I mean, they still performed the mission, yeah. you know, to the way they were supposed to do it. And all throughout history, they still continue to do it. To, to them, Amazing. Like not, not completing the mission is the, the, the peak. Like that's, that's no matter what they're going to, complete yeah. the mission it's like not an option to, not, to an not yeah you're right to, to complete the mission yeah that was the first time i had met people that held completing the mission in such regard like yeah and and sometimes you know beyond their beyond their means they they couldn't for whatever reason um they just never they never would forget it like i didn't right so yeah um yeah that was <clears throat> that was kind of the tone um back to back to that rotation that was kind of the tone of the 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 rotation there um we got to we did a i can't remember maybe like 13 missions or something like that um wow. 13 14 missions it was all good um i don't have any other really crazy stories from there some of it's just like i know man my last couple of deployments was strictly all you land on the y you walk to the x you sneak in you roll a bunch of dudes up you take them home i mean it wasn't like Nobody shot anybody. So I mean, a lot of the, a lot of it's like that. I mean, you just kind of all rolls together. It's not what you see in the movies, you know. The majority, the majority of the time, you're yeah. right. It's like pretty normal. Bread and butter. You surround the house, and the guy comes out, and then you leave. You know. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Or he's not there. You and, go through all the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or it's a dry hole. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. God, I don't know how many dry holes we hit. Man, gee, many Christmas. Yeah. You just walk in. It's like oh, nobody's here. Just a woman. You know. He probably got <laughs> intel that we were coming, and got you know he put. He squirted and we didn't find him so yeah uh i would say like one other one other big mission that that stood out to me you know part of the part of the job that we were asked to do part of this uh doing these oga missions like like you said like we bring a lot to bear a lot of that is coordinating with different agencies we would have to for sure um, where we were at we didn't have um rotary wing support organic so you'd have to coordinate with the army unit uh, conventional army unit. we called them dsrw conventional helicopter dudes you had to like go and, and work with them and then i had to work with the task force guys like hey does this work out this timing and then i have to work with the oga guys so like one person kind of roping all these cats together but we finally did it like we had been wanting to go to this village for a very long time the stars are lined we get in these two conventional uh maybe it's three 
two, uh, two or three conventional uh, 47s. And as you're, as you're flying, everyone's pumped up. They're like, this is a bad village. Um, you know, we're, we're definitely, we're definitely going to get shot at. We're going to get into it. It's going to be a bloodbath. So everyone's like super hyped up and on, on ingress, like traveling to the area, one way that they would notify the surrounding areas that you're coming and they start shooting at you from the hilltops or tracer fire. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, that happened quite frequently, but that, that was happening. And then, you know, I'm listening on the fire's frequency in the bird and I'm hearing the assets that are overhead and it's like a, it's like a mass exodus. There's three ways that traffic could exit this village. It was kind of in a bowl, uh, but it, the, the pilot's like, looks like I-90 out there. Everyone's like getting the fuck out because they know we're coming. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And these two, <laughs> these two trucks, they must've been the slow individuals. They were like the last ones out, but they were driving, as we were coming into land, they were driving towards us. And there's no way they could have seen the helicopter. They could have heard it, but you know, it's dark out. They couldn't have seen it, yeah, later, yeah. but they were driving right towards us and i'm i'm hearing this and i actually see the headlights and i'm hitting the i'm hitting the gunner i say hey shoot shoot at him dude he's coming right towards us we don't know what he had sure sure he didn't he didn't fire we land the uh the team leader hops off of the ch-47 does a front roll because i don't think it had stopped moving but he hopped off the back did a front <laughs> roll fixed his nods sprinted to the top of the hill dumps an entire mag into the second vehicle or into the first vehicle that's coming, changes out his mag and then shifts to the next vehicle and dumps an entire mag into that vehicle. And the whole time Jeez. I'm like trying to run after him, like <laughs> both ears are going off. I'm like, there's, there's people being drug out of the first car. The team leaders over here by himself shooting at this other car. It was just chaos. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It was, it was, He's like a one man, one man army, just like kill it, shooting at everything in town. But part of, part of the complexity to it was we had another team dislocated land at the same time to kind of cut off their route of traffic. Well, in between that team and us, there was a two guys on it. I I think we had um, I did thirteen or ten strikes or something like that that night. Uh, you know, dude wow. dudes on a moto with um, crew serve weapon, and then we would find all these we'd call them fighting positions that, you know, hot spots that people were trying to conceal themselves that we saw in the mountains that we had movement, people trying to conceal themselves was considered hostile and set just based on the intelligence, um, from the area. So I was just waylaying, For sure. waylaying people. I did hellfires from an Apache. Mostly it was AC 130 just into the hilltop and just all night, uh, left and right. They had three guys, probably unbeknownst to them, but they were moving towards our Xfil HLZ and we can see yeah, yeah. hostile intent. They did a um, coordinated attack at the time, 40 millimeter. And then the Apaches were flying with flechette rockets that evening. So nice. for, for free, people don't know flechette rockets are they're two seven, they're small diameter rockets, but they have razor blades inside of them essentially. Um, yeah. So that was the first, First and only time I, I got to employ with those. Um, nice. I approved, they were so far away that I proved them to go off, off axis. So they're shooting with the gun and flechette rockets, just spinning around in a wheel while the AC 130 was continuing to engage. So that was pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it was, That's some good deconfliction, man. Yeah. Well, I just told them. You learned your lesson from the from before when you were at the 13th. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So yeah, it was. Uh, you can use them all at once. Yeah. I had a, at, at the, <laughs> at the end of the night, there was a, um, OGA guy who was a former air force dude. And, and he, he came up to me afterwards. He's like, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen, man. I was like, Oh, really? <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. It is cool, man. Yeah. It is cool. Like, Damn. I didn't think about it. Um, that was, that was probably one of the, the better missions we had. Um, yeah, it was cool. Nice. cool to see everyone get hyped up and, Everyone came back. Nobody got hurt. I think that was like the, one of the biggest things I eventually started to, to really think about. Um, you know, as long as everyone came back, which uh, for the missions I went on, I was really fortunate. Everyone, nobody, nobody was killed on any of the missions that I, I went on. Injured, yeah, but. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was, that was, um, that was a big mission. Uh, my first OGA deployment. The second, the next one. 
Um, I got uh, blown out for um, a big combined uh, mission between Rangers, uh, ODAs, and some of the OGA guys. Uh, I got activated thinking I was going to go support that mission, but they're like, no, 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 you're going to you're going to supplement. We're going to pull the JTACs to that are with this battalion. It was um, 175 guys. Yeah, we're okay. going to pull because they've trained with us. We're going to pull them from where they're located at. And you're just going to fill in their slot while we do this big old mission. So I was a little disappointed. Um, what did you? Yeah, that like, sucks. You're pulling me from that range. So I get to go babysit. But the the I got the last laugh, the uh, the J the. The JTACs didn't do anything. I don't even think they went on a mission. And I went back to the same OGA location. And the first mission out, I, I, I was dropping uh, laser-guided rockets and stuff like that. So it was good. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh. On what? What were you dropping on? Uh, it was the, um, the quintessential tech piece scenario or the quintessential JTAC scenario where, you know, you, you've, secured your, uh, you've secured your building. And everyone's just kind of sitting, waiting for um, to finish up doing sensitive site exploitation and stuff like that. And yeah. here comes a vehicle out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, now the vehicle's turned its lights off. Yep, okay, it's picking up speed. Okay, the, the blocking position's fired, and now it's still going. Okay, now I hit it. Like, that happened. Oh, uh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly how I said it. They were like, the standard, yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. You'd, you'd receive traffic about enemy fighters coming to reinforce um and sure enough man the blocking position where it was at was firing at it and it didn't didn't stop it so um wow. but i was like you know immediately when you hear a vehicle it, it was pretty far off right but immediately the first instinct is to send up a nine line and a cast briefing and uh just hey i'm letting the <clears throat> ground commander close hey i got it teed up man if this uh, if this kind of goes bad, we're we're set and ready to go. I can we'll handle this. And sure enough, yeah. that's, that's what happened. Like they didn't stop; they kept on coming towards us. So, um, what kind of asset did you use? F-16s. Oh, yeah. nice. That was one of the that was the first time we had I had employed with um, laser guided rockets. We just do yeah. quick, quick, too quick and short succession. And I mean, it's laser guided, so huh. don't miss. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, I, I've seen it go bad with uh, personnel in the open. Um, yeah. But the vehicle, it was it was fast, man. It was really fast. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, cool. Yeah, and I ended up um, staying staying longer. The the JTAC who got pulled up, uh, they had a storm in Savannah. A tree fell on his house. So. Um, oh no. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's like he he asked if I could stay, and I said, yeah, of course I'll stay. So I, st sure. I stayed the rest of his rotation, and he went back to fix his house. So nice. It's uh, pretty pretty awesome, you know. I stayed longer than I wanted to at a cool location, and I got to drop bombs and meet some cool guys from One Seven Five. And the next the next one was uh, a team bath rotation, where you know they consolidated everyone in the country and made one strike force. It was a team bath or, or at Bagram Airfield. <clears throat> Um, I think this was moving into 2017. Okay. Um, uh, like one, but people kind of, once you've done the OGA rotation, like people are really reticent to go back to doing the, the strike force mission because you're, you know, you're at the headquarters, you're, you're having to wear uniform, you're, you're under all the, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, but, um, I think I was the NCO I see at that point of the detachment and felt like kind of like it was my duty to fill, fill, fill that role. So other guys can do the OGA rotations and get that experience. Sure. Um, and it was great. I had, <clears throat> I worked with an FS, a Ranger FS NCO, uh, Steven, Steve was his first name. He's still active duty as far as I know. Um, and it was awesome. We, we did a, we did plenty of missions as a, as a strike force one one that he's still so he uh, he's still doing the fs nco gig but for another organization um and he uses one of our missions as an example as like a training iteration but it was uh, oh no kidding about, yeah they had um you know through through you guys um th through the guys you used to work with and in other means they've collected this huge amount of intelligence of uh all these areas 
that were just a little bit far out of reach to do on a nightly basis, uh, because to, typically you try to do everything in one period of darkness, but they're right. a little too far out. So they came up with this um, concept to do to stand up a stand up a cold base and use it as a jump off point. And man, I was just impressed at the the way that they were able to flow flow like a advantine into this cold base, set everything up to receive the strike force um, and assets and, and refuel everything. So we, yeah. would, we would wake up and we only did it for a couple nights, but we would wake up, kind of get our general target as the strike force. And it was two platoons at the time. They're like, okay, you guys are going to go in this area and we'll kind of refine the plan and details at the, at the now warm base. So we kind of develop some initial products, get on the plane, fly to the warm base and then get refined. Like, cause they would have assets over the target house. Um, yeah, yeah. like, getting current real-time intelligence and we had to refine the planet and it was awesome like all the squad leaders would you know draw on a piece of paper this is where our containment is going to be set this is where isolation is going to be this is our blocking positions um this is who's going to do what this is where we'll make entry and they're, they're looking at the live feed video and, and making all this plan and then you know it's just a short flight away um this was a this was a two platoon mission to a house that was labeled a Uh, mosque it was labeled a mosque this is this is important later uh, it was labeled a mosque so uh the one platoon with steve uh flew in and did an offset and surrounded the place and then i was on the the second aircraft to come in to the x um so we landed uh they had taken a few bits of contact um initially but it wasn't really crazy uh we the the folks who landed on the x cleared a compound um, that was probably like 700 meters away first while they were doing um, sort of an SSC they set containment on the mosque and then uh, we were finishing stuff up on that other compound and uh, Steve and the ground force commander met us up at that compound while the while the rest of the rangers were um, trying to deal with the mosque and the, the folks they had uh, barricaded shooters inside there yeah. <clears throat> so we're all in this other compound, um, kind of talking. I hear uh, uh, hear an explosion, which is not uh, not anything crazy, right? Because they they had uh, satchel charges trying to get these guys out, and I didn't uh -huh. really have the full picture of what was going on over there. Um, you hear an explosion, and some time comes by, and I hear over the the inner team net, like, "Hey, we have uh, casualties." And I, and I looked at Steve. I was like, hey, man, did you hear that? He's like, nope. Uh, and it was a female voice coming over saying we have casualties. Like they would bring um, cultural support teams with them, which had female. Sure. Uh, and I told the command, they said, hey, they've got casualties over there. He's like, what? And then the just like any, any casualty situation, like the initial picture is maybe not what it is. Um, yeah. So they were trying to finish things up in this compound. They said, "Hey, we need we need we need litters over here." So I ran. I knew generally where it was. It was me. I left Steve with the GFC, um, and then I ran with the medic and two other guys uh, over there to this compound. And it was like super surreal. Um, I'm like I stepped over a body. Uh, or, you know, I saw a ranger like facing out pulling security. And I looked down and yeah. I see a body, some dudes leaking on the ground. And it was, it was an enemy fighter. You could tell by the, uh -huh. know, by the man dressed and then, uh, run over to the wall or the wall of the compound and you hear nobody is screaming, but like, there's a lot of groaning. Um, and I helped the guy open up the litter, get it set up, get the, they have, um, bags, warming bags. Uh, I can't remember the acronym for them, but they're sort of like body bags, but they retain heat of people that are injured so i open it up get it set up and i help load one of the rangers on the litter and like as things start to i find out later <clears throat> later in the evening that the uh, afghans initially went into this this mosque um there's tons of dudes in there they're all you know all barricading themselves in different rooms in this large building yeah and because it was initially labeled a mosque they did not allow 
us to just drop on it, right? Like the, the option right. could have been to just everyone pull back, drop on it. We've confirmed there's no women or children inside there. We did well wouldn't it rights, but because they, someone had labeled it a mosque, that wasn't an option in people's mind. So they just, <clears throat> the Afghans showed up in there, um, saw the amount of people and the weapons that were in there, and they just refused to go back in. So now the Rangers have to take over. And they're throwing like Jeez. satchel charges against the wall and blowing holes in the wall and pulling guys out of it. Uh, but there was a pocket of dudes in one corner of the building that were just not, you know, they they weren't going to come out. You had to you had to get yeah. them out. So uh, the acting platoon sergeant, he was he got he got stepped up. He was the weapon squad leader, awesome guy, but he wasn't the normal platoon sergeant. Him, two squad leaders, and a uh, and a guy who he was a he was a ranger, but he wasn't part of the platoon. He was um kind of like a special troops guy um mm -hmm. all four of them are trying to clear out this room they're they're throwing throwing frags in there and the enemy threw a threw a fragmentation grade hit the acting platoon sergeant in the chest and he yelled grenade and everyone kind of dived out of the way and uh all of them got shrapnel um oh, nobody died God. but they all got like shrapnel in their legs and thighs and yeah, yeah. Um, so that was the explosion that I heard previously. Oh, okay. Was a grenade going off in there? Jeez. Um, so uh, <clears throat> by the time I get the worst guy on the litter, um, Steve had come over, and uh, the 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 first sergeant who was on there, um, he's like, "This is a mass cow. We're going to exfil now." So it was pandemonium. Mm. We had to use. Um, you always plan for a, a Kazovac HLZ as close as you can. So yep. the, the helicopters will come in. We had to use that and it was right next to the building. Guys on the litter got on there, but we had to come up with uh, HLZs on the fly. So Steve um, was kind of helping out at the Kazovac HLZ. He asked me to um, find HLZs for the rest of the force. And it, it was just, it was mm -hmm. pandemony because we didn't know, we didn't know at the time who were there still bad guys in the yeah, building yeah, yeah still bad guys in the building. oh so jesus like, you know you're looking at the window and uh it was, it was just nuts um the squad the acting platoon sergeant i he went with me as security for me to set up the kazovac i noticed i didn't know he had been hit at the time but i noticed he was limping limping oh. and sure enough he had like shrapnel on his leg but he was still like making sure the place is secure to get the guys who are hurt worse out of there. That doesn't surprise me a no. bit. Not one Fucking bit. Hard. That's the way they do hard it, man. As nails, man. Thinking about everyone else. Yep. Um, so I I run out with a couple other guys and set up set up three HLZs, um, and then I ask the AC-130 to because troops are are making their way out there. I say, hey, man, I need you to paint paint a path with your IR laser for the people to follow to come out to these HLZs. Um, and we were able to get get everyone out. I was on the one of the last chocks, and the dust was so bad. The first helicopter comes in, picks up the worst patients, no issues, luckily. Um, and then the second and third helicopters come in and pick up the majority of the for force. But the brownout was so bad um, that you couldn't see. You know, as the guys are coming in, I'm telling everyone in my chalk to to hold on to each other so we don't lose anybody. And you can when the helicopter touches down you can hear the change in the pitch of the rotor blades so to know that they've they've gone wheels down it's all good yeah, so yeah. i never heard that um change in the pitch but we kept going because we knew generally where they're going to land because we saw them coming in the brown it happens and we're running 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 through the and i don't see anything and then i don't mm. hear any noise and all the helicopters had lifted up and it's just me and my chalk of seven eight dudes sitting on the ground that i didn't know this and i was trying to communicate with them but um you don't want to talk over the radio when they're landing um yeah, they yeah. not touch down they just gone around so we we're just sitting in a sitting in a group oh, of no. eight guys just <laughs> in the middle of nowhere like jeez waiting for them to come back around I'm like, <laughs> vulnerable yeah, I was like, All right, yeah we're gonna you know i had a i had a squared away uh squad leader there helping me out too so made sure we had accountability because that's a big thing right you gotta have accountability of everyone so yeah. equipment, I was carrying uh, two weapons. I was carrying the we two weapons of the guys that were hurt, just choking, oh my choking me off of my neck. Uh, I remember <laughs> that. Yeah. 
right, I got their weapons. Everyone's grabbed their helmets and their <laughs> nods, but uh, they came around and picked us up. It was uh, like no big deal. But the initial thing, like you're running and uh, you're going to get on the helicopter and you get out of there and it's just nowhere to be found. It's like, are, did we get left? Yeah, yeah, it's like, what, what are we doing? Yeah, I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. oh, shit, they forgot. But it was just, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was pretty pretty wild, but um, Steve still uses that as a kind of a, a scenario training aid. Like when everything goes to shit, and your key leaders who make those big decisions are injured or incapacitated, like how do you divide and conquer, or how do you prioritize what to do? So um, yeah, I can't believe they didn't let you shoot that mosque after all those guys were after that grenade went off, or at least after a sit rep. Like hey, they're this. This is a bad guy haven. It's not like it, they're not in there praying, you well, know. Uh, upon further review in the AR, it was a it was a madrasa. The difference between a mosque and oh, a madrasa okay. you know, is, a, is a school versus a place of religion. And they did right. they event they they dropped on it after we left. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So like one yeah. of the big things like words. You know, everyone says words mean things, but like that time it cost nobody died. Uh, no, no American. Luckily, died. I mean. Yeah, yeah. It could have been really bad. Heck yeah. That's, that's the worst scenario everyone's talking. One is, number one is a squirter that nobody's tracking that like gets mm. the drop on. That's how uh, rangers get killed. Um, yeah. And then the other one is a barricaded shooter. It's like really hard to deal with. So. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a big, big um, mission. Uh, after that, they were standing up another OGA team and they asked me to come out to another OGA base and I got to do that for the latter half latter half of that deployment and um nothing nothing crazy over there it's just kind of nice just to see another um OGA how they work so yeah that's how <laughs> that's how it ended up um it was cool right on and I had I had one more I had one more uh rotation where I did about a month with another OGA location um I got asked I I tried not to deploy like I needed uh I asked for a break like I just was, mm -hmm. in, and uh, one of the guys who was supposed to go, they found some crazy medical issue with him, and and the flight chief at the time, uh, he's still in. I, I can't remember his uh, his initials. He said he called me on my phone. and said, "Hey man, we need you to deploy." I was like, "Okay, yeah," begrudgingly, yeah. but um, but I got to go to another OGA base for like a month that time, and um, I replaced. Uh, one of this, one of our recent Silver Star recipients. Where, oh, really? Where got that Silver Star at that location. Um, <clears throat> Cam, his first name. I saw it. Okay. I, super, super great guy. I, I was, at, I was cadre at one of his selections. Very impressive. Like him and another guy, Zach, were like the top two guys. Uh, and he had wild, wild stories. So, coming in to replace him, and that was was pretty crazy. Um, the guy who had medical issues recovered or it was fine. Good. He took my spot and it was uh, when things with North Korea were, were kicking off. So uh, we, they, they had extended deployments to five months. So it wasn't three and a half, but five month deployment. So I did about a month at the OGA location and then I got pulled up to do the kinetic strike desk um, for, for four months. And that, oh, that okay. was tough. Tough. Like, sitting there was tough or was it like i mean was it just boring or it wasn't it, not boring but like you wanted to be on the field you don't want to be at a desk you yeah know? is that kind of what you're getting at yeah uh, i mean it was it was all those things um you know yeah. that's i would in one deployment i my time of being out in the field and being a jtac was like over um so that yeah. was really tough to take you know i that's how i mentally took it like all right it's over i'm moving on um, doing a 12 hour shift if you've never worked shifts is brutal. I remember my first two yeah. shifts. I'm like looking at the clock and I go back and I look and it's like not even an hour gone by. I'm like, Oh no, I got 12 <laughs> hours of this stuff and you, you don't get a break. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, I don't, holiday. I don't think I can't, I don't think I've ever had to, I can't remember a time when I've ever had to do that, but it's, yeah, I just can't imagine. Just because you can't, it's not like you can, it's like there's stuff to do. I mean, you're in a, you're in a secure location, you're, you're deployed. It's, you know, it's, yeah. You know, you can't just get on your phone, just start scrolling, whatever, you know, yeah. or they, yeah. they had a, uh, you know, they had the, I'll say this, like the Ranger officers didn't do this, but like 
me as an enlisted guy, like I had no qualms. Like I was already kind of pissed that I was already, I shouldn't say pissed, but I had no qualms. They had a media drive. So I, if I wasn't doing anything and nothing was going on, like I would watch movies or I would do school. They had nipper net on there, but yeah, like the stuff to keep yourself entertained in the 12 hours when nothing. Oh on God. Yeah. I mean, what else would you do? I mean, you had to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Shift work. That was shitty. There's no day off. No, like, there's no days off. Like, I got a um, uh, upper. Well, I had pneumonia during that time, and I, yeah. it got to the point where I was just like, "They're like, okay, you have to, you have to get out." And uh, but that was the only time I had off. I, was, I had pneumonia, and I didn't do my shift for like a day or two shifts. But there's no holidays. There's no weekends. It's like get in there man so uh, what the benefit that i did get from that was um i learned a lot about how um how certain assets work in the kinetic strike realm i got really really smart on that really quickly and then i got to i worked at night when all the missions were going on so i got to help c2 from a fire's perspective missions so all of the guys in my detachment um i would i would watch their missions um Oh, yeah, nice. And, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, I got to see, you know, it's so funny. And, and a lot of, a lot of, everyone has their different personality. Uh, I'll just call him V. Uh, he, his team leader, there, these are all at OGA locations. Uh, him and his team leader were like two peas in a pod. They're both like extremely aggressive alpha male dudes who just <laughs> wanted to get in a fight. And we always had to like reel them back in. Like, no, dude, you can't. <laughs> drop a 2000 pound bomb in this house, man. You just have to kind of take it easy. And he, <laughs> you know, he would tell me offline, he'd be like, yeah, I'm, I want to be the first guy through the doorway. I was like, dude, that's not, that's not your job. No. Yeah. That's not your job. It, uh, I, it's commendable. I get it, but it's not so much that like, um, Hey man, that's not your job. It's like, dude, you have to think about if you get taken right. out, then there's nobody to control all those cats assets. You know, there's nobody there, there to, do your job. You're the only guy there that can do what you do. Yeah. So if you, if you get shot in the face, walking in a door, then that's it. You yeah. know, it's yeah, it would suck to lose you. We don't want you to get hurt, but you also have to think about the mission too. You have to think about you, what your role, the role you play in this, yeah. in this scenario. Right. For sure. you, you would, yeah. you would now become a, a liability or like, well, not only that, but yeah, you would, you would, he could be potentially a detriment to the mission because now nobody can control those assets and they could get overrun or whatever, you know, anything can happen. Anything. They won't find squirters because the guy's not talking to the ISR asset, whatever it is. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, yeah. A- admittedly. Yeah. It's hard though. Cause you see your boys, you see your buddies, your Ranger buddies, and you're like, I want to do that, man. I'm going to go do this. And you know, could, it's like, no, nah, hold on. <laughs> I could hear. Yeah. So they would call over the, the team leader would call over SATCOM requesting to do stuff. And I, and I would hear V over the radio net to the assets also requesting. So I would hear both sides of it. Um, nobody okay, else yeah. in the jock would hear that JTAC control except me, but we would give them an, we would give them an answer they didn't like. And I would in, be envisioning in my head, the conversation those two <laughs> dudes were having with themselves. And they're like, man, fuck <laughs> those guys. They don't know what it's about, man. They're not in the shit like that. <laughs> yeah, fuck them. All right, we're going to do it anyway. It, it was, uh, <laughs> they eventually got in big trouble. Uh, I can't remember what they did, but they got, they got stood down and called. Oh, and really? They got, they got a talking to. Uh, oh, okay. So they, got, they got sorted out. They were out. getting a little too aggressive. They were, man, they're like, assets, see a guy with an AK-47, 3K that way. We're going to take him out. Or like, no. It's, it's like everybody's got an AK, yeah, man. Like, it's like oh, man. that's that's the the nature of that country. Yeah, uh, uh, like aggressive was, yeah, an understatement. But and then you had you had guys, <laughs> uh, Mike, who who came back and, and took my spot. Um, awesome, really. I think he just finished doing um, weapon school not too long ago. Like incredibly smart, intelligent dude, really squared away. There's um, MJ. Um, he he had a he was doing cast with an RPA in the middle of the day, and just really doing really impressive. Everyone, Nick also was. <clears throat> um, uh, it was just nice to see um, how things would go, and depending on the JTAC's personality experience, how things would play out, like their weapon. Um, 
how the, the weapon selection, how they would solve problems. And um, so yeah. I got a really good perspective on how all those guys worked and how they solved issues. So that, nice. that was the benefit. And then, um, yeah, that was, that was kind of all she wrote after that deployment. I had made master sergeant and, and, if I had made Master Sergeant, they had reserved a slot as a flight chief for me down at Fort Benning HQ, and I was I was over the moon. Like that's what I had wanted to do for a very long time, and it it ended up working that's out. That's awesome. Uh, nice. Um, I went down there, and everyone tells you that like, flight chief is the best time in your whole career, and um, it was a good time for me. There's I had a lot of challenges that were outside of my control. Um, we did a we did a AFSOC did a magcom wide safety stand down and for other guys who are downrange or, or some of the national mission unit guys or special mission unit, anyway the the high level dudes they got stood down yeah um so it was wow. it was uh, you hear about this uh i don't think so uh, they had um the, the catalyst to it was they had two or three training deaths in like a month across aspects. oh i guess i did hear about that yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they shut everything down and, and I, I was um uh, i was getting poopy because we were in a validation exercise for guys to go down range again and i had to yeah. myself and my flight commander had to go to the battalion commander who was awesome he uh yeah he was really awesome to work with um uh, he's like i get it but you had to tell him yeah i stood outside of his office like i was in trouble like in the principal's office but I said, sir, right. sir, my guys can't train with you anymore just because of the safety stand, stand down. He's like, I get it. He was really cool. But, um, so, yeah, he's smart. So guy. Was, he understands. Yeah, he, he gets it, man. It, it, I always feel like my credibility took a hit there, but it was outside of my control. And then, and then COVID hit. So we, I did be, because at the time we were not part of, not part of a national not part of a, a higher organization at this time. So we had a limited amount of slots down range. So I had worked out a deal with Ranger where I would, on my first deployment out of Fort Benning, I would stay behind for first of the half. So my guy could go down range and then I would, I would flip flop or whatever. So I only mm -hmm. did like, um, like two months, um, in 2020, but, but when I, when I left, you know, the world was one way. And then when I came back, it was another way. It was because uh, COVID yeah. hit. It was. It was. Oh weird. right, right. Yeah, it was really weird. Yeah, mm -hmm. you didn't even get to ease into it like we all did. Nope. Kind of. You were just like, don't, don't, don't get by anybody. Put a mask on. Don't do. Nope. You can't go in here. You can't mm -hmm. do this. No, there's like a, crazy. Yeah, we'd hear we hear news about it. We're like, oh, there's a fire going around the world. That's crazy. And then, <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. We'll see you later. See you in a couple months. And <laughs> I remember uh, one of the. Uh, I was working at the combined situational awareness room not to be confused with the combat search and rescue but i got right, asked right. to work there and <clears throat> uh, a new one-star general came in and it was just shooting the shit with him and he was like yeah man the world's changed i was like oh shit he's like because we were here things about no toilet paper um that was a big one. Oh yeah i was like we got plenty here tons of toilet paper yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's like, yeah, there's no baseball games. There's no movie theaters. There's nobody on the road. I was like, oh man, this is weird. Yeah. Sure yeah. enough. Um, that, yeah. It changed. Yeah. That had to be a weird thing to come back to. Well, and I meant to kind of the, one of the, one of the things that has always been weird about those 17th deployments was your turnaround time is so short, um, between you finishing up, uh, they call it rip toa or like kind of relief in place is, uh, you do a handover mm -hmm. with your people and then shortly thereafter you're on a very short plane ride back to the u.s so like right. a few days before you were in a combat area and then now you're i'm driving my tacoma back to my house uh, All right. so that was always kind of weird to me it never messed me up was, you know I was, I was always cognizant of it but it was super weird driving home 2020 and there's nobody on the road nobody in the highway nobody, oh yeah and not that i want people to greet me when i come home but like Nobody was there to welcome me back from deployment. I just put my bags on my back and walked, <laughs> walked to my car. And it's <laughs> it like, it's like going home from work one yeah, day. It's yeah. Exactly. It's like in a, a normal day. Yeah. yeah. It's like, all right, threw my weapon in the armory there. I had to like call a guy in to put my weapon in the armory and then, yeah, let's go. So, um, 
and then my last last deployment with the 17th was in 2021 time frame so uh i went back to the same spot uh, me and another guy from the 17th did more of the the csar stuff um yeah which was in, insightful you're doing kinetic strike stuff but you're doing cas for the uh, afghan national defense and security forces and that was it and then uh and then I left there in 2000, November of 2021. Right on. Um, so I want to I want to talk about something because you have your you got your master's degree mm-hmm. uh, from uh, Norwich. Norwich, yeah. right? And uh, and that, but that's not it's not just a normal master's. Like you got it in in like a management or business. What was it? Business or something? Uh, so it was a master science in public sector leadership. Public sector yeah, leadership. Very, okay. Very broad. So that's a good point. Yeah. So. No, but it, it's good though because I want what I wanted to do um, is kind of get your take on like a, some leadership stuff. I mean, like you're you've been a leader in some elite units. Um, you you went to Norwich, which is a, a pretty prestigious um, school, uh, and we're taught leadership. So if you had to, and I don't want, you don't have to go on and on, you know, a, a, a big presentation, <laughs> but if you had to um, like give anybody an advice on leadership. Like, what would you, what were some things that you've taken away from both, you know, leading, you know, elite troops to, you know, just a, going through a master's degree in leadership? What would your, what would your take be on that? Oh, man. Yeah. So the master's degree focuses a lot on um, theory. And so uh, it was nice to think back to those experiences that I had in leadership positions and then knowing the theory behind it. Um, one thing that I, I continue to struggle with, um, that I wish I, and that I try to practice more and more is, um, listening and you hear it all the time, right? Active listening, but, um, it, we struggle even, even right now, like we struggle to, to kind of listen to other people. And, um, so I would say, um, trying to actively listen and pick up on those, uh, nonverbal cues, I think all the statistics are made up on on the spot, but you know, they say like 85, 80, 90% of communication is nonverbal. And if you're thinking about what you're going to say next, you miss a a lot about the nonverbal cues that people are are giving you because they may tell you, they may start talking to you about something, but there, there typically is always like kind of a deeper context or meaning behind it. And if you're not actively listening, um, you miss that stuff. So, I don't know. If I, you hear that a yeah. lot, but like active listening is, is thing something that I struggle with as well. Um, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, very rarely does anybody ever say anything nowadays that is f- straight from the heart. You know, there, there's always some sort of artil- or ulterior motive or there's some sort of they they want you to, to derive some sort of information from what they're saying they don't want to exactly give it to you, you know, so it's kind of tough to, so that's a good point. So picking up on those, those nonverbals can kind of tell you exactly what this guy's trying to get at based, you know, he's maybe telling you one thing, but then his, you know, his body language is telling you something completely different, yeah. or he's like giving you some indication that you should be reading more into what he's saying, right. not necessarily like taking it at face value, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it, part of the, part of the reason why I kind of pursued that degree was, I was exposed to, uh, I mean, the, the Ranger Regiment is like a leadership organization, right? They, sure. Um, everyone, everyone's a leader, and they, you really get to see people exercise those skills in real time in combat, and it's really impressive to see from sort of the junior guys down to the to the lieutenant colonels, the battalion commanders, the the S threes, and. Uh, we talk about it kind of, kind of in line with active listening, but how you choose to communicate to people. Uh, yeah. I think our commander here kind of alluded to it as well. How you choose to, how you interpret a situation, and choose to respond, um, often determines the response that you get. So, hey, you know, I yeah. think we should think about this, or, you know, is the polite way to say, this is what I feel because I'm in a position of power. <clears throat> and I'm telling t- this to you politely so you can kind of get the hint and still keep a, a, a very good working relationship. Not that conflict's bad, but if we can get 
if I can get you to do things by just saying it a different way or articulating it a different way, then that's the way I'd like to do it instead of just being in your face direct. For sure. Because that's empowering to a person. Be like, hey, I think we, you and I, as a team, should get should do this endeavor instead of me saying, hey, you – go do this right yeah. now. You know, it get, it gives a, and you may call it a mind screw or whatever, or, but it's just, it's just a good way to put a person at ease and kind of give them a little, um, buy-in to the endeavor. Right. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're, you're empowering this person to take the reins on this project. You're not that way. It kind of gives them ownership of it as opposed to you just saying, Hey, do it, do, do my will. Like I want you to, you yeah. know? So it gives people a little more uh, motivation to, to, to do your, to do what you want them to do, essentially. Yeah, you're Which, you're motivating, not necessarily manipulating. Right. Or, and I, the way I always looked at it, man, I, once a guy told me to do something, I owned that project. Then, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm doing this for the commander. It's like, no, now he's he's put it in my hands. Whether or not I get credit for it, or, you know, whether or not he, what, whoever, it doesn't matter. Now it's mine. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, you know? So yeah. uh, if, if you can, if you can instill that in someone else, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. There, there was an interesting, um, the commander here turned me on to blink list, B L I N K L I S T blink list. So huh. essentially it's like cliff notes for all these different sort of books, but you know, <laughs> uh, this, uh, this public speaker queer, queried the crowd is like, Hey, how many people, how many of you in this room work for, for themselves or are, self-employed and like only a few percentage rose her hand and it was a trick question right he said all yeah. of you are, are self-employed all of you have the power to take responsibility for the job even though like technically there's a manager or leader so just like you're alluding to like if someone gives you a project uh you should you should treat that as as you're take now taking possession of it or i'm part owner in this right. i'm dictating my future you know uh, I think that's yeah. extremely powerful and that, you know, often makes the difference. I see that a lot more now that I've, I've gone back to an air force base where uh, maybe not necessarily the air force base, but you know, people are really too quick to say, I'm just going to do my job and then I'm going to go home. This is all it is. I don't take any personal stake in this, how this organization performs. I'm simply going to do my right. job and then go home and then do it all over again where yeah, it's to the detriment of the mission and, and the people. It's hard to find those who take personal responsibility for a lot of things. Or even maybe like a sense of pride, yeah. you know, like, uh, like, hey, I'm going to do this job. Yeah, because then you run, it's it's very easy just to get into a rut and just be like, oh, I'm just going to do my job and I'm going to half-ass it and then I'm going to go home yeah. and then I come back and do it again. Yeah, who cares? But if you, it, yeah, exactly. There's no it, there's no gravity to it at all. So if you, if you could own it and be like, hey, I, I'm going to take a little pride in this, and if everybody kind of did that, you know, like collectively, you would have a better product, obviously, yeah. you know, so, yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. I, I would think, um, yeah, that, those are the really top ones. I, yeah. I don't do, uh, I think people misconstrued uh, 360 degree leadership or 360 degree feedback stuff. I think people misconstrued that as like just going around in a circle and um, telling everyone how, how much they suck and, and then admitting how I suck would. The, the true meaning behind it or the true intention is, you know, the four, four aspects, right? Um, you should do feedback between you and your subordinates. You should do feedback between you and your peers, feedback between you and your superiors, and then feedback between you and yourself. That's the true 360 degree uh, feedback session. And I don't think a lot of people do that. Definitely not the self one. I think, you know, I think that's the one no. that's missing like the reflection <laughs> on what you've done. You know, I did, I, yeah. I'm horrible at that. I kind of just plow through and, have a tendency not to look back at what I've done. And so it's almost to my, it's sometimes it's to my detriment for sure. Yeah. 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 It's hard uh, to do that. So it's a, uh, it takes a lot of emotional intelligence to recognize uh, what feelings are, what triggers those feelings. And then um, how to identify them and then cope with them. And then, and then the, the next level up is like, recognizing those feelings in other people All right and yeah and uh and then then you can take it even the next further is not just you and another person but you and a group how you read the room just exercising emotional intelligence and i i got into a disagreement with them um, psychologist obviously he has a doctor degree in it but i was like the people who have emotional intelligence um seem to be on the more successful side versus those who are just book smart or smart in one aspect but it's the emotional side that kind of helps people stand out or 
be more successful. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because you're, you're dealing with people. So it's not just like, you're not just pulling levers or like making Mm -hmm. widgets. You're like, there are people involved. So if you, if you lack that certain amount of emotional intelligence, you're, you're, you're really cutting out a large piece of your, your your employee base, I guess, or the people that you're working with. Discounting the human element to it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, Cool. cool, man. Do you have any, um, do you have any, like, I don't know if you, is there anything in your life, like your personal life, that's like um, any kind of charities that you're passionate about or any kind of endeavors that? I um, initially know when I had to think more about it, but um, there's an organization that helped out Luke Page when he was going through, when he was fighting his battle with cancer uh, twice. And it was a Hunter, Hunter Seven Foundation. Okay. Um, I think a lot of people may have, may or may not have heard about it, but I think they're, what they're doing is they're going to Congress and advocating for people who have these, uh, who, who get these crazy types of, have you heard of it? Uh, crazy I types haven't. of cancer, uh-uh. just out of like super young guys getting, um, very aggressive cancer, um, seemingly out of the blue. Yeah. And uh, what they're doing is they're advocating for, for veterans at the national, like political level to, to recognize that these are not normal and that that they're um likely tied to what they've done um in the, in their line of service yeah, so, yeah yeah i actually now that you mentioned that i have heard of that yeah, yeah i have heard of that like there's like they're detecting certain types of cancers at a at younger ages now like i suppose like yeah. i was talking to um a doctor friend of mine the other day and he's like yeah, i'm screening people for well you know there's usually like these cancers that everybody talks about like you know but now he's now he's screening people that are even younger like 30 years old so for anybody that's yeah. listening don't don't feel weird about going in to get checked don't don't wait you know especially if you've been overseas um there's a lot of things that uh, the our society is changing and it's affecting us negatively in some way that they haven't quite figured out yet, but they do know that, like to your, like you were saying, there are those those diseases and cancers are, are popping up a little more sooner than they would have than they have in the past, right. I guess. Yeah. 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 There's something something going on, and I think people just uh, just like people talk about Agent Orange and how they that we were uh, reticent to admit that that was causing all those health issues with those. But right. Right. Same. I don't, I don't want to necessarily link, link the two together, but you know, there's uh burn pits and, and all that. They have the burn pit registry now, but I, I the pack think just got, 100... just got um, passed. So that's, um, that's something that has yeah. to do with that kind of stuff. You know, like if you have any kind of respiratory issue or any, um, any kind of anything like that, you know, the Congress just passed the PACT Act, P-A-C-T Act. Um, so yeah, so to your point, about that. yeah, get that checked out. I mean, don't wait to get this stuff checked out for sure. Yeah. No, no. Um, I, I would like to say, he doesn't know me, but I attended one of his um, transition assistant uh, assistance program courses, um, Ramiro Villalobos. Yep. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but uh, man, I was, uh, I was really blown away. He's heading that up. Um, and I think that's a great thing. He's now changed the name. It was for TACP, but it's a uh, Air Force Special Warfare TAP. Um, it, it's not it's not something I, I want to apply right now. Uh, I'm going to spend a few more years, but I'm just really blown away at the efforts that he's put in and the good things he's doing for for folks in our community. Yeah. So he's yeah, crushing he's it. Listening. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't he doesn't know me, but uh, I was overly impressed with the job he's doing. Nice. Um, and then and then a few guys. Uh, I just want to. Shout out to the Hunter Foundation. Okay. Uh, it, they've helped out S- similar along the lines for like soft soft veterans. Um, two guys that I know have, have been through there and are like one guy's a fellow or a mentor for them. So it's really kind of nice to see organizations willing to willing to recognize guys for what skills they have and then helping them transition. So I think that's cool. I still have a couple more years to so transition, I, I believe, but um, <laughs> just nice. It feels good for people to to just help us out in a real way, not just, um, Oh, for sure. Not because they have to. Like I was just talking to Tommy case about this the other day and he, we were just commenting on how it's not really a hit. I'm not trying to, it's not a hit on air force, uh, in general or the, the big military taps program, um, which is for those who don't know, transition assistance for veterans who are getting out, you know, they're going to do something else. Um, but to, 
when you um, streamline it like Tommy's doing and, and Ramiro's doing, uh, it helps out. It specifically helps out a dude. And kind of Brandon Temple kind of mentioned this before as well. Not necessarily about this, but like just organizations in general, if they specialize a little more, it, it, it helps out as opposed as opposed to going to these these huge broad organizations that kind of they they help out everybody a little bit. I think it's better to, to kind of like I said streamline it and you know really dig deep into what this guy needs, you know, and I think that's what Tommy and, and Ramiro are doing um, with this, with this uh, special warfare tap. So if you're yeah. fixing to get out, if you're a special warfare guy and you're getting out, definitely hit these guys up and, and see what they're up to. Cause, and like you said, what was the other one? The honor, honor foundation, the honor, honor foundation. Hon- There's an, uh, yeah. Um, I've had two guys, two guys from the 17th um, get accepted. In, and Ramiro was another one who, who went to that, went through that program, the honor foundation. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's um, it, it's just I w- I don't want to say it's like a networking uh, organization, but um, it helps helps folks transition. Sure, and it, um, at the have, at the very least, you like you get exposed to these guys have already been through all this all these wickets. You know, you you you've seen yeah. you know these guys have already been there, done that, and they can help you. They can just give you stuff that they already know that that you wouldn't inherently know just by going through a normal TAPS class. So, right. All right. Yeah, it makes me feel good that there's people out there yeah. doing this for people. I, you know, it kind of, it's always nervous getting out, but um, so I've heard. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, my mine was yeah. weird. I, I did it quickly. I, I got, I, it took me from from the time I decided to get out to the time I was out of the military. It was like thirty days. So like I, I was really? like, I blew through it super quick. So I don't, I'm not really one of those guys that can give any advice because I did it a, kind of a, a weird way, but. Um, I wish I could have done it a different way. Obviously, that's not optimal. I, I don't. I do not. I don't recommend that at all. That's not the way to do it. Uh, okay. But yeah, it's really it's uh, it's nice that things are starting to come to fruition like that. Those changes. Those those guys are helping out. So yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Uh, this is awesome. Really, this is really good. I appreciate yeah, it. I hope I hope it uh, provides some context for some folks and. Gives everyone an idea what the what the maybe younger younger generation was doing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. All right, man. No, but I can't thank you enough, man. I appreciate you sitting down with me and, and uh, sharing your experiences and sharing all that stuff at the end there. That was really good. So I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I wish I was a better storyteller, but I know, well, I mean, me too. I I probably won't even be able to use this episode, but so I mean, so I just <laughs> that's just yeah. delete it. I won't even save it. No, I'm totally <laughs> kidding. No, it was great, man. It was it was really good. good. So I appreciate it. Yeah. That was great. All right, brother. All right, JD. All right, I'll talk to you later. Okay. All right, see you.